that is always a little bit more more intensity. To be honest with you, I don't even think about the other ones. I'm behind the wheel. And now up against the wall, he gets into the wall. It heightens uh, everybody's nerves and anticipation, and everybody drives a little bit more aggressive. The names are made here. I think we're all trying to fight for the same goal, and everybody's hungry. <laughs> Names are made here. Welcome back to the Subway Firecracker 250, powered by Coca-Cola. Daytona International Speedway. More of the storylines that we need to follow before the green flag flies. Let's go to pit road. We start with Kelly Stapps. Rick Chase Elliott kicked off the 2016 season with a win right here in Daytona. It's a day that he calls special. Well, since then, the 88 team has gone to work to make this car even better, and they think they found more raw speed. Chase admits they struggled a bit in qualifying, but he said the car felt really good in practice, and he thinks it will draft well tonight, which is really all that matters. Chase Elliott starts 15th. Dave Burns. Kelly, Eric Jones has won four times in the Xfinity Series, twice this year to lock himself into the chase. But do you think he's satisfied? No way. He's really tough on himself and wants to do better at tracks like Daytona. Expect him to be hard on himself, race hard, and maybe end up at victory lane here tonight. Mike? Dave, Joey Logano's crew chief, Brian Wilson, told me today he feels like this season they've been behind. But the one consistently bright spot for them has been restrictor plate races, and you can understand why. They've been in contention to win both of them. Crashed out while going for the win in Talladega. But here in February at Daytona, they were second after leading 40 laps. They feel like this is the place where the 22 can cash in and get its first win of the season. Marty? Well, Mike, earlier, Chris had told us the story of Matt Tiff discovering a brain tumor a couple of weeks ago. The day they discovered that brain tumor, they tested it for cancer. That turned up negative. Of course, Matt wanted to stay in the car, but the doctors wanted to do the surgery right away. In fact, that surgery was tonight. And good news, Joe Gibbs Racing officials just told me that Matt Tiff is out of surgery. As the doctor said, it went exactly as planned. He's resting comfortably. One thing for sure, David Reagan's going to have a very big fan. The man above him in the roof tonight, Matt Tift, whose car this is. Let's go trackside for the Start Your Engines. And now for the most famous words in motorsports, please welcome your Grand Marshal, United States Air Force retired and proud Subway franchisee, Sergeant Kelly Miller. Dr What a great way to kick off 4th of July weekend. And right here with us at Daytona International Speedway.
NASCAR on NBCSN is brought to you by the Subway Sandwich Shop. Fresh is what we do. And by Credit One Bank, the official credit card of NASCAR. And welcome back to Daytona International Speedway. Tonight's starting grid is brought to you by Subway. In the first row, David Reagan and Austin Dillon. Austin Dillon actually won this race a year ago. Yeah, in row two, Eric Jones with two wins already in 2016, starting next to Sprint Cup star Joey Logano. Row three, we have Daniel Suarez starting next to Daryl Wallace Jr. And back in row four, Justin Allgaier and Brennan Poole. They finished second and third at the last Super Speedway, Talladega, back in May. Yeah, row five, we have Elliot Sauer, who won the last plate race in Talladega, and a very talented Corey LaJoy. Row six, we have Ty Dillon starting next to Benny Gordon. Benny Gordon making his career best start this evening. Back in row seven, Brendan Jones and Ryan Reed. Ryan Reed actually won in February 2015 right here at Daytona. Yeah, row eight, we have Chase Elliott, who did win here in February, starting next to Blake Cook. Two longtime Xfinity veterans, Brendan Gaughan and Jeff Green, make up row nine. J.J. Yaley, a veteran in this row, as well as Mark Thompson. Actually, Mark Thompson is just making his second Xfinity start tonight. Yeah, row course ace Justin Marks and Mario Gosman make up row 11. Row 12 made up with Eric Amarola, Sprint Cup veteran, starting next to Ross Chastain. And back in row 13, starting 25th, Joe Nemechek, a two-time Daytona winner. Row 14 and his first Xfinity Daytona start, Spencer Gallagher, starting next to modified champion Ryan Priest. Row 15, 74 year old Morgan Shepard starting next, next to Ryan C. Back in row 16, Bobby Gerhardt, so good at Daytona. Eight times he has won in the ARCA Racing Series. Row 17 is NASCAR veteran David Starr and Joey Gase. Two Florida natives make up row 18, Scott Lagacy Jr. and Ray Black Jr. Back in row 19, Ryan Ellis and Alex Gwinnett. They are making their first Xfinity Series Daytona start tonight. And also making his first Xfinity Daytona start is Garrett Smithley and P.J. McLeod make up row 20. So the field rolling around this two and a half mile super speedway. Let's chat with one of the drivers and see if we can talk with Eric Jones, Jeff. Hey, Eric, it's Jeff Burton, bud. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing all right. Not too bad of a day when you get to go racing. Yeah, it's always good. So you, are, you have two wins already this year. Tell us what it's going to take to get this win tonight. Well, I think staying up front is going to be the big thing for us. You know, it seems like every time we can stay up front of these speedway races, or at least in my short experience on speedway races, we can uh, come out of here with a good finish. So stay up here and uh, hopefully stay out of trouble. So since you already have two wins, you're already in the chase, does that allow you to be extremely aggressive to try to stay in the front tonight? It does open up a lot more opportunities for us to stay aggressive. Uh, you know, if we were in a traditional points format, uh, like I was last year in the truck series, you really got to be conservative at these races and try to come out with a good solid finish. But with the chase format, it allows us just to go out and race, which is great. I love it. So we'll uh, try to stay up front, try to get up here, and and uh, contend for a win all night with our DeWalt flexible camera it should be uh, should be pretty fun. So in the Xfinity series is a rule that you cannot lock bumpers and push. How the challenges is that to keep from locking bumpers and trying to push a guy to get an advantage? It's a big challenge here. You know these uh, these cars really want to lock bumpers. That's how they want to go. That's how they want to draft. So it's such a big advantage when you do lock bumpers that uh, it's, it's tough to. As a race car driver, you want to do the thing that's going to make you the fastest. So when you know you can lock on and go faster than everyone else, you want to do it. So it's tough to stay off them, but you know that uh, you're going to probably get the black flag if you do it. So try to be to, to follow the rules. Well, good luck managing all that and have fun tonight. All right, 10 4. Thank you. So impressive to be able to talk to the competitors just before they're about to take the green flag. That's coming up next here on NBCSN.
this weekend is rich in tradition. This 4th of July weekend here in Daytona. It's a time for all generations to celebrate. There's nothing in the world like being at the World Center of Racing. And in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, there's much to be excited about. Eric Jones will get his first win of the year. He won at Bristol on the concrete. He wins at Dover on the concrete. The NASCAR Xfinity Series has a new concrete king. The future of the sport has arrived, charged with carrying on its traditions, but also leaving their own mark. Daniel Suarez wins for the first time in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. And there's no better way to do that than a victory at Daytona. Nobody will beat Ryan Reed to the start-finish line, and he has won here at Daytona. Tonight, NASCAR's next generation shines under the lights as they go wheel to wheel with some of the biggest stars in the sport. It's the Firecracker 250. The future stars of the sport are on track right now in the Xfinity Series and our aerial coverage provided by our partners at Smithfield Foods giving you some great pictures of the action tonight around this two and a half mile super speedway. We are also going to ride along with a few different drivers including Ty Dillon in the number three. That is the Chevrolet on board. Ty Dillon will start in the Sixth row, 11th position. Daniel Suarez, number 19, has the Sunoco on board. He starts in row three in that fifth position. Joey Logano in the 22. The Ford on board, starting in row two in the fourth position. And right next to him, we just spoke with him. Eric Jones in the 20 has the Toyota on board. He will start in the third position. Take a look at the race facts for tonight's events 200 miles or 250 miles 100 laps pit road speed 55 miles per hour most people will think oh it'd be easy to get down to 55 miles per hour but once they're going over 190 miles an hour it's very difficult to get down to 55 miles per hour on pit road the fuel window 44 to 48 laps Steve yeah I think it really gets going to come down to a strategy of how many tires you need the fuel window is big enough track position will be important it's going to come down to you want four fresh tires or two fresh tires at the end of this race pack racing they can come close but as Jeff you, you mentioned with Eric Jones they can't lock bumpers they can bump they can continue to bump and try to aid the car in front of them get a little bit of a run but they have to stay off where they can't lock bumpers and stay attached all the way around the racetrack pace car is making its way off of the track and onto pit road that leaves the field in the hands of David Reagan. Green flags in the air. We're racing at Daytona. And already the top four working together to get up to speed going through the gears. You can already see the temptation to lock front bumper and rear bumper and try to push. You can see how when they were making contact, it was help pushing them out. But you have to separate. If not, NASCAR is going to penalize you. Two by two, they go down the backstretch. A beautiful sight under the lights of Daytona. Three wide now. About eight rows back. As they make their way through the travel for the first time. And the trial is not an easy turn. It's not a straightaway on the front stretch. It's definitely a turn, not as much banking. Yeah, that actually makes the trial more difficult at times, Rick, with that lack of banking. You still have to make the corner, but very little load on the race car. David Reagan out in front, driving that number 18 for Matt Tiff, who just got out of surgery. Just behind Reagan, Eric Jones. Daniel Suarez in the 19 has already won this year. 
You can already see right now, it looks like the inside line is going to be the preferred place to be. That's going to be, as this race moves on, that's going to be big. Where do you want to try to be? Do you want to try to be on the inside line? Do you want to try to be on the outside line? And it could change depending on which cars are what line. Right now, we have three Toyota teammates leading on the bottom line. Yeah, I think that really affects which line has the strength. When you have a second and third place competitor that are patient and willing to ride behind the leader, they can really give some strength to that line. Yeah, if, if the two cars in the outside line, if the two car and the 22, if they could just lock up and just stay locked up, they have a great chance of catching the front pack and maybe even pulling ahead. But as we've talked about, you just can't do it. If you stay locked up too long, NASCAR is going to penalize you. Hit, get off of him, hit him again, get off of him, that's okay. But constant pushing, you'll be penalized. Joey Logano, one of the best, and he is right behind the two of Austin Dillon. Austin Dillon won this race a year ago. Working that outside line, trying to catch up to the inside line, led by David Reagan. You know, another advantage that inside line has, Rick, is they have the protection of that double yellow line. They know that no one can blow the double yellow line. That's out of bounds here at Daytona. So as long as the leader can keep his left sides against the double yellow line, he can protect that side. Although we're seeing now some organization and a move by Dillon out of the top lane. Austin Dillon's going to take the lead away from David Reagan. Can he bring Joey Logano with him in the 22? They're going to move to the bottom of the racetrack. They are the top two. We're on lap four of 100. There will be a competition caution at lap 15. That is because they have not had a lot of time on the racetrack. Yesterday, they were supposed to have two practice sessions, but the rain came, abbreviated the first session where there weren't all of the 41 cars that were here. They weren't able to get out on the track, and so that is why we'll have a competition caution at lap 15. And Rick, I almost credit that pass to Boston Dillon's to Joey Logano. Again and again, we've seen Joey Logano, one of the most aggressive pushers, and having that balance figured out between locking bumpers and just continuing to make contact. Jeff, it always amazes me. We come here year after year, but the, the closeness of these cars as they're going 190 miles an hour around Daytona and moving, trying to change lanes, trying to fit a car in a spot where only a car link can fit. And you have to do it. You have to be aggressive. If you're going to win this race, you have to be in the front. You have to obviously get track position and keep it. But to do that, you have to make very aggressive moves. You have to side draft. You have to go into holes that your car will barely fit in. To do that takes nerve. And you almost have to take, you have to forget about points. You have to forget about that and only try to win this race if you want to win. You can finish 10th by being conservative, but you can't win it by being conservative. One of the craziest things that happens at Daytona is the communication between driver, spotter, crew chief. We were listening in to the seven on the bump drafting that's taking place. Here's what they had to say. 22 car pushing. Imagine that right outside you there. He's still locked bumpers with him. Same old story. Outside, you're pulling him now. Outside, pushing again there. It's unreal. Outside, just a 22 pushing him out there. Still there, door. Mike. And great communication between Justin Allgaier and his, and his spotter. However, he is having a little communication problem with his crew chief, Jason Burdett, as they rolled off and took the green. He said he was having difficulty hearing his crew chief. They haven't rectified that yet. He can obviously hear his spotter very well, but they're a little bit concerned about the communication between driver and crew chief right now, Rick. And, you know, Rick, some of that frustration you heard on the radio is when you go back to the finish here in the spring, Joey Logano pushed Chase Elliott out there, and they came really door-to-door, -door, quarter panel of fender to the line. The garage area, the consensus in the garage area is, is it was pushing, but that wasn't the consensus in the NASCAR control tower. They have to monitor that. They felt Joey Logano was bump drafting, not pushing, but not a popular move in the garage area. And it's an extremely difficult call to make. I, I wouldn't want to be NASCAR trying to make that call very hard to police, in my opinion. Austin Dillon back in the position he was in one year ago when he won this race. Austin Dillon in front at Daytona.
near the back of the pack. About four cars involved in this first incident. Ray Black Jr. being one of those in the 07. 25 also involved. Scott Legacy Jr. and the 90 of Mario Goslin. It's hurt bad. Alex Gwinnett. Also, I believe, involved. There's the 25, the left rear quarter panel damage. Again, they were mid to probably 75% back in the pack when this took place. Let's take a look at what just happened. We talk about us pushing and, and hitting on each other. Well, sometimes that results in what we just saw. This contact from the 25 car looked like to me. Well, we talked about a little bit earlier how tough the trial oval can be, and that started in the trial oval. It looked like the 25 either thought he was clear or the car got tight and pushed up. For some reason, it started to change lanes, got into the quarter panel of the other car, causing the accident. Yeah, the 25 of Scott Legacy Jr. moved up the racetrack. That's the yellow hood on that car moved up the racetrack. And you don't know if he was trying to get in behind him or as you talked about, you're in the trial where the car gets a little bit light. Maybe he lost the front of his car, had to chase it up the racetrack. Not real sure, but obviously the contact started with him. Alex Gwinnett in the 97 from Montreal, Canada. Got tagged and then around he went. That's a big hit right there. Ray Black Jr. in that white, blue, red car, those seven. When you're up against the wall and somebody comes into the side of you and hits you like that, that is a big impact. It doesn't look as dramatic as, say, Kyle Busch's wreck look today in practice, but that one really hurts. Another look at speed. That camera really shows just the speed these cars are traveling. I think it's easy to lose touch with how fast they're going because these drivers do such a great job of running in these tight packs, but when the car gets backward, it's amazing how much faster it looks like it's going. Yeah, and all these teams running toward the back, they're, these aren't heavily funded teams. They're lower budget teams, don't have the funding that some of the front runners have. So this has a major impact on their finances. One of the things that's going to happen when they come to pit road, because there's a competition caution scheduled for lap 15, they will not be able to add fuel under the stop. So pit road will be open. The drivers can come in if they want to make any adjustments, tires, but they cannot add fuel until lap 15 in that competition caution. And for that reason, Rick, I expect to see very few of the front half of the field pit. Fuel is really the whole point here. You need to get to that fuel window. Lap 15 caution will get them there. Just a few takers at the back of the field making their way to pit road. The first accident happens early at Daytona.
Watch every Xfinity Series race with the NBC Sports app and get closer with additional camera angles, driver stats, and track information. It's available on mobiles, tablets, and connected TVs. Download the app and find out more at NBCSports.com slash live. NASCAR has let us know that the competition caution has now slid to lap 20. So they will go a few more laps before they come to pit road under that caution. Welcome back, cars side by side once again as we get ready for the restart. The Subway Firecracker 250 powered by Coca-Cola. Austin Dillon shows the inside line and Joey Logano will be on the outside line. And Joey Logano showed us, I think, exactly what it means to bump draft at Daytona. Yeah, this is the point of contention with all the competitors on what's the difference between bump drafting and pushing. So if we ride along right here, we're going to see the 22 push the two out to the lead. And it looks from a distance that they're locked up. But when you go on board with the 22, Jeff, we continue to see some movement between the front and rear bumper. This is, I think, the most difficult call in all of racing to try to make this call. But if you see they're bouncing, he's not. It looks from the side like he's locked completely up, but they're bouncing off. And that's what NASCAR told us. When they look at it, they have to look and see if the two is literally getting away from the 22 and there's a there's a bouncing effect if it is that they don't consider that locked up but I understand why the competitors would look at it and say hey he's pushing it because if you're behind it it certainly right. looks like that I again I think it's an extremely difficult call to make and Rick whether he's pushing bouncing drafting he's totally blind Joey Logano in that position is close to 200 miles an hour pushing a competitor and cannot see through that car in front of him it's like going down the interstate following a tractor trailer just hoping everything in front of him is clear yeah and think about that when you're going down the interstate you don't want anybody right on your back bumper well here you do <laughs> at over 190 miles an hour getting ready to come into the restart zone you'll see that on your screen Austin Dillon the control car on the inside. Green flags back in the air. Eric Jones helping the 22 of Joey Logano out in front of Austin Dillon on the restart. Elliott Sadler in the one now on the outside. Leading that outside line. Elliott Sadler already a win in 2016. Will be a part of the chase at season's end. New for the Xfinity Series in 2016. There's another example of why that call is so difficult. You know Austin Dillon is saying they're pushing him. They're locked up because the two outside cars, they, you know, they were pushing and, and got to the front. So it's we're going to see this all night. And then when you think somebody's doing it, then that means you can do it. And that, that's just going to be a continuation all night long. Very early on, we see blocking taking place already. Joey Logano moved to the bottom of the track. That gave the opportunity for Elliott Sadler to make the move on the high side. Well, rarely do, you, rarely do you race to a guaranteed yellow flag where we have one six laps from now, Rick. So they're going to jockey very aggressively for position before the competition yellow. And Elliott Sadler. Oh, oh. The six of Darrell Wallace Jr. is going to go around. He catches the 48. The big one happens in front. Two of Austin. Dillon is collected. 
three of Ty Dillon gets through. Brennan Poole involved in the 48. You see the 19 part. Daniel Suarez, a win already this season. Austin Dillon, last year's winner in the Xfinity Series race on this 4th of July weekend. And this is everybody's fear at Daytona and Talladega, getting in a wreck. You didn't start it. You had nothing to do with it, but you get torn up. Uh, it is what is what makes Daytona so frustrating for drivers. It's so much fun to race here. It's so so much energy compelling to win. But it is so frustrating to get caught up in somebody else's wreck. We saw Joe Nemechek, Justin Marks. Take a look at what happens. It all starts right here with Darrell Wallace Jr. and Brendan Poole. You see trying to help the 48, trying to help the six. But as the six moves left to right with contact with the bumper, it spins it out. Heavy contact between the 42 and the two. The two gets airborne, but safety comes back on the tires. And that is why NASCAR does not want these guys locking bumpers. It's why they don't want pushing. And again, it creates this rule that they have to enforce, which is very difficult. But this is why they have that rule. Brendan Poole gets into the back of the six, trying to help the six. Didn't get his front bumper lined up to the six like he needed to. Got the six going in the wrong direction. This works well when done properly, but when not done properly, this is the result. Eric Jones in the 20, also involved. The only driver with a win this season in the Xfinity Series, Xfinity Series regular that wasn't involved was Elliott Sadler, and that's because he was out front. And that was the contact Eric Jones felt. Hold it. That noise, that sound, that impact, that's why I'm sitting up here. Just, you know, you can expect coming to Daytona, you're going to be in the wreck. You just expect. And then the contact there. We just caught, got caught the right rear. We made it through it, but then we got clipped in the right rear. Going to come to you with the right side damage, guys. Daniel Suarez is almost Suarez. completely clear. But you see right here, there's a gap between the 6 and the 48. As that gap starts to close, the 48 hits him once, everything's fine. And then he hits him a second time closer to the right rear corner. And you see that starts to move the tail of the six from left to right. Darrell Walls Jr. does the best he can to regain control. But at these speeds, he loses control, gets into the 20. And then you start to see just back and forth. You see the 19 in Daniel Suarez as it leaves the screen, almost has it collected. The two, great to see that car come back onto the yes. ground. We saw cars go airborne in Talladega. That car could have easily went up and in the air and flipped over. The roof flaps open, the cow flaps open, set the two back on the ground. And the problem started with where Brendan Poole was trying to bump drag. You're still in the corner. You still turn the wheel. You, your car is not loaded up in the straight. And when he first hit him, there was a big gap. So the first time he hit him, he hit him hard. And that got Darrell Wallace Jr. kind of out of shape. The next time he hit him, that finished him off. The timing of when and how you bump draft is very important. The first time you hit a guy, you got to roll up to him. You got to drag the brake just a little bit and make slight contact in the corner. On the straight, you can hit a guy pretty hard. The front bumper and the rear bumpers line up really well. But again, you have to pay attention to when you're trying to bump draft a guy. And just a number of chaos get torn up. It's just, and you think you've missed it. Like you think, I'm going to get through it. Next thing you know, somebody's running into the side of you seen this so many times. What a close call also for Corey LaJoy in the 24 went through the grass. Dave. Rick these drivers and teams always talk about how to avoid the big one will run up front and you won't be in trouble. You saw where Eric Jones was running third on the inside line so he was up front trouble still found him. Eric calls the car pretty messed up. The steering is straight but a lot of other problems. Marty. Dave, you can see top right of your screen, the red flag has now been displayed here at Daytona. As you guys saw, Daniel Suarez nearly made it through that. However, they do have right front damage on that car for Daniel Suarez. He said his steering wheel is out. You can see that orange piece of state tape on the steering wheel. It's moved to the left. That means the toe is knocked out on the car. They actually thought about taking it back to the garage area to fix this damage, but they are going to try and repair it here on pit road. But obviously with the red flag out, they cannot do any work now, Kelly, but you can see that right side damage for Daniel Suarez. Well, and this is going to be hugely disappointing for Daryl Wallace Jr. He called this a high expectation weekend. In fact, told me just before the start of the race that he thought he had the car to win. Well, he's got a lot of damage to that six. He said the toe was knocked out pretty good. They already brought it.
brought it down to get four tires and check the clearances. This is his second time down pit road, and Bubba back out on track said the steering is messed up, so they're going to go to work as soon as they can here on the sixth to see if they can't get him back out there. Rick. A very abbreviated practice yesterday. Did not let a lot of drivers get out and run in the pack. But this is what happens when you don't bump draft exactly right. NASCAR on NBCSN is brought to you by Ford. We go further so you can. And by Xfinity. Change the way you experience TV with Xfinity X1. Big one happening early. We're under a red flag condition. Let's go to Mike Massaro. And Austin Dillon out of his race car. A good race car. One that had led quite a few laps, but uh, a short night. What did you see? I'd seen the six side draft. The guy in front of him and the 48 just got into him, but it's just a product of guys trying too hard too early for competition caution 10 laps from now. I've seen it out of my side, out of my peripherals. I tried to go low, just didn't get low enough. So I knew when the six was up there, it was, I didn't know what was going to happen. But uh, part of it, I guess, is just speedway racing. I wish I would have went lower. I made the mistake of not getting low enough when I saw it. I uh, thought I had missed it, but part of it. And, um, you know, just proud of these dream guys. They brought a fast car. We're seeing a lot of bump drafting already. Uh, what's it been like out there so far? I mean, it's part of it. The cars line up fine. So, it's you just kind of have to know when you're pushing a guy sideways, I guess, is the biggest thing. I mean, uh, when you get to somebody, you want to be lined up square and, and push them straight, and you don't have to side draft this early in the race. That's another thing. Early night for Austin Dillon. Certainly had a car capable of winning tonight, Rick. Yeah, absolutely. Top 10s in his last 10 Xfinity Series starts entering tonight. That more than likely is going to end. Let's hear from his brother who made it through that accident. He can chat with Jeff. Hey, Ty, it's Jeff Burton. Close call for you. Tell us what you saw. Uh, guys trying to get a little too much too soon. I know this is a short race, but uh, I think 17 laps in was a little too much. But, uh, yeah, I, got, I was able to get slowed down enough, um, kind of work my way through it. 
saw Joe coming back across the, the track and knew that was going to be close. Lucky he was able to throttle up, but uh, in the midst of it, saw my brother up in the air again. It's not real fun. I, I'm not a fan of watching him race here the last couple of times. And I'm glad he's okay, but uh, a little, little too exciting right now for uh, how early we are in the race. So we have already seen drivers trying to lock up, trying to bump draft, and that was the cause of this wreck. Tell us how you, what your strategy is to try to do it without causing a wreck and also not getting penalized. Yeah, I think that's the uh, the gray area we're kind of working in. Is everybody knows the bump is is pretty valuable. It's just doing it at the right time. And you know, my strategy is just to stay up front, and stay in the top four or five here at the end of the race. So uh, you know, get connected to a good car and hopefully have enough room to uh, push them out. If we have the opportunity to take the, take the lead, we're going to go and try and win this thing. Well, Ty, thank you for taking time to talk to the fans here during the rear flag. Good luck the rest of the night. Buddy. Ty Dillon, the younger brother, he's 24 years old, out of Welcome, North Carolina. His brother, Austin Dillon, in the garage because of this accident. Pit road is open. This is considered the competition caution for the Subway Firecracker 250. Let's go to Dave Burns. Rick, because Ty Dillon did not slide his Goodyear tires in that incident, they won't change them. They'll just give him Sunoco fuel, Mike. Joey Logano has a very fast race car, and it seems to be handling better once things settle down. So it was a little bit tight off four, but other than that, pretty good. Marty, Elliott Sadler, no tires on that. Fuel only for Elliott Sadler, also fuel only for David Reagan. You see the hood up because they're trying to cure a cooling issue. The car has been running warm, so it'll be fuel only and taking care of that cooling issue for David Reagan, who leaves pit road now, Rick. Yeah, we see that a lot. Cooling, definitely difficult when you're running so close to the cars in front of you. Race off pit road, Ryan Sieg, Ty Dillon. Sieg making up nine spots on pit road.
NASCAR Race View gives you access to features that let you follow your favorite driver as you're on or at the track. Get live stats, leaderboards, driver and team communications, and more on all your devices. It's available now for an all-new low price when you visit NASCAR.com slash Race View. Subway Firecracker 250 involved in this most recent crash. 14 different drivers. And you see the first seven here, the second seven, Eric Jones involved, Justin Marks, Brennan Poole, and Joe Nemechek. Mike Massaro. Uh, Brandon Jones was another one involved as well, Rick, and he sits in his race car right now as the RCR team goes to work on it, trying to re make repairs and get him back out of the racetrack. But, Brandon, uh, obviously you didn't want your night to end like this. What did you see? Uh, I saw that we had made it. I thought, you know, I had a clear path right there. Uh, figured we would we'd get through and then uh, last minute got, you know, knocked out in the, in the right front there. So uh, really unfortunate for our Florida Chevy. I thought we uh, we had some form tonight for sure. One of my better tracks, I think, on the circuit. So unfortunately, we couldn't uh, strike on this uh, this event, but uh, they'll all be next time. Lots of work going on. Have they given you a damage assessment on the race car in terms of maybe how quickly they might be able to get you back on the track? I know they had to change the radiator. Uh, There's a couple of holes in it. Uh, pretty big uh, fender damage as well. So I think they got to do a lot of modifications up there. But we'll see. I think we'll get back out there and try to at least finish out the night. With the chase berth perhaps on the line based on points, Rick, a lot of these teams in here right now making as much repairs as they possibly can trying to get their vehicles back out on the racetrack. Absolutely. Every point counts for these Xfinity Series regulars. And we saw something happen there where the two almost got off the four tires and over but it stayed on the four tires and came back down. I want to take a look at our animation. This is the NASCAR heat evolution animation from our wind tunnel. Yeah Rick we've put our car in the wind tunnel here you see the airflow of the car going straight it's front to back but when we spin the car out the air goes up over the roof from the back creates lift that opens these roof flaps the air then hits the roof flaps slowing the air down over the roof of the car just setting it back on the ground. That's right so watch the two car. You can see as he, he's spinning, now he gets straight, now he's going to get hit. This is when cars have gotten airborne. Look at the roof flap. So now the roof flap's up in the air, preventing that lift from occurring, making downforce, helping get the car back on the racetrack. That's the advantage of the roof flap. That's a worst case scenario. He's being hit by another car, that's helping him launch up into the air, the roof flap comes up, helps set him back down. And a reminder, NASCAR Heat Evolution, that is released on September 13th. Pre-orders are available online now at NASCARHeat.com. That's a great look at how the roof flaps, cow flaps work to keep these cars on the racetrack. And that's just one small item, Rick. You know, we've heard all weekend long, Austin Dillon had that just horrific crash here at the end of the cup race a year ago here at Daytona. We've heard all week long about what they've learned from that crash, a bunch of different safety innovations. Some worked, some didn't, but NASCAR always looking for ways to make racing safer. And let's go to another that's been involved, Kelly Stavis. Getting caught up in the big one, it came early. How did you see it unfold? Yeah, uh, the, the outside lane was going pretty good on that restart. I know 48 was pushing the six pretty hard, and and I think just just hooked him and got him loose off of two there. And at that point, you got to just pick a pick a lane and and try to slow down and hope that they don't come back in front of you. And they all did. So I know I hit the two a ton and got got hit a ton after that. So it's a bummer. It's a bad deal. But um, there's a lot of veterans here and active duty military here. Um, and that puts everything in perspective because uh, there's a lot worse days than crashing at Daytona out there. And, and I'm just uh, really excited that Comcast Xfinity got all that, all those guys here. Thank you, Justin. Thanks. Justin Marks talking about the different installations from our military friends that are being represented on the windshields of these Xfinity cars this weekend. Justin Marks was carrying the 2nd Battalion, 6th Marines. Regiment. As you see, Ty Dillon. He has the 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines Typhoon on his windshield. Ty Dillon very involved with Hope for the Warriors as well out of Camp Lejeune. Elliot Sadler won at Talladega earlier this year. Elliot Sadler has the Third Brigade, Brigade Combat Team, 101st Airborne. As we get ready for the restarts, 
Elliott on the outside. Ty Dillon was able to hang on to that inside spot. Every one of these restarts, Rick, it's a, it's a, almost a rehearsal for the end of the race. Each driver figuring out how much we can see the front two rows push. This is the most aggressive we've seen. We've seen a couple cars do it, but Jeff, now we see four cars too wide with that push through one and two. And we say push. NASCAR's looking at it. You can't lock bumpers, but you definitely can bump all the way up through the gears and up to speed. Elliott Sadler surges out to the lead. Ty Dillon on the bottom of that line trying to stay in front of Joey Logano. And then on the outside, it's the 18 of David Reagan. And you're going to see Elliott Sadler. He's going to run the inside, try to block that inside momentum from coming. He wasn't able to do it. They're jumping on the outside of him. Cleared him. So Ty Dillon, with Joey Logano's help, is going to go to the lead. Here comes Joey Logano now, looking for the lead as he goes to the inside. And Logano leads at Daytona. So now the great bumping. Example. Great example. Bang, yep. Hit. Get off. Hit him. Get off. Get it. And he's not locked up completely. That's a great example. You can see how he hits him and comes off. It probably looks like he's pushing him to the three car. Probably looks like he's solidly pushing, but he's not. But you see how he got off him right there. You mentioned about areas of the racetrack, Jeff. When we talk about Daytona and handling, it's not really the straightaway. It's not really the middle of the corner. It's the transition. When a car goes from a loaded part of the corner, it unloads to come up on the straightaway. Coming in here in the trial, the car never settles. It's a very difficult place. You don't want to push or bump another car in that location. Corner entries and the trial, well, those are the toughest spots. This was the pass by Joey Logano. After shoving the three out in front, Logano decides to make the hard left turn and take the lead away from Ty Dillon. Oh, and around goes the 20. Eric Jones spins now. Get it locked down. There's nothing else coming. And the caution comes out. Nothing coming when you're ready. It's been a tough night already. The third caution coming out. Eric Jones around again. Bring it to as best you can here. I don't think you hit anything, did you? Sounds like he's got a tire down to me. It sounds like it may, it may have been why he spun, or maybe after he spun, he flat spotted it, but it sounds like you can hear a tire flat from inside the car. Leader's just now at the line. He, I think he probably cut a right rear tire. He had damage on the right rear quarter panel from the previous wreck. You can see all the, the tape. Quite possibly the tire got against something that had been damaged and ended up cutting the sidewall of the tire. That would be my guess. I don't know for sure, but I, I'd say that's a pretty good guess. Anytime you can spin at Daytona with cars behind you and don't hit anything, it's pretty good. That's a good day. Yeah. But it has been feast or famine for Eric Jones this year. Two wins already, but also finishes. Outside the top 20. Oh, definitely right rear tire. Hang on to it there. Hang on to it. We lost the right rear some guys. Get it locked down. There's nothing else coming. Great job. You, know, you see, he turned the car. He had to correct the car. Got onto the apron. He was able to, because of where he was, that was a big advantage. Had that happened to him getting into the corner, he would have spun and been, been a wreck. But getting off the corner gave him some room. Dave, you got something? And Jeff, you were right earlier. After you have a wreck like that, as you know, you pit multiple times to fix it. And each time you go around, you mention the next thing that might still need to get fixed. They thought they had the tire rub fixed. Obviously not. So they continue to work on the 20. Eric Jones. And, and Steve, it's very difficult when you're in the pits. You think it's all clear, but you can't. You don't travel a car. The car doesn't move like it does on the racetrack. So the team did intentionally do something. Seconds. They thought it had enough clearance, but once the car Gotta travels, that clearance can. narrows up. Yeah, and if not, if, if it's not the car traveling, Rick, at 190 miles an hour, the amount of air on the sides of these cars is tremendous. It can push the quarter panel and just stick your hand out the window, running down the interstate at 70 miles an hour. Feel the force on your small hand versus the size of that quarter panel. 200 miles an hour, blows in, rubs the tire. That's what ends up happening. And it looks like he's got a parachute on the right side of that car. He goes around bringing out the caution for the third time tonight.
NASCAR on NBCSN is brought to you by Toyota. Let's go places. And by the Subway Sandwich Shop. Fresh is what we do. What a gorgeous evening as you see the sun setting. Our aerial coverage provided by our partners at Smithfield Foods. Racing under the lights at Daytona International Speedway. Always a great experience. Unless you're Eric Jones. And we ride along with Eric. Listen in to what just happened with him. Jeff, that is so violent. What does that feel like as a driver when you're going nearly 190 miles an hour and you hear what sounds like almost a gunshot? Rick, honestly, it scares you. I mean, it honestly does. It happens so quickly. You're not expecting those kind of things to happen. And all of a sudden, there's an explosion inside the car. Next thing you know, you're turning around sideways, and it gets your attention quickly, without a doubt. This is the position you hate to be put in as a crew chief, too, Rick. You know, you're forced. Eric Jones in this 20 car, they're forced to continue for points. They're, I know they have won and they're in the chase, but this is good practice because in the chase, you're going to have to finish every race, get every point you can. So while they may technically not need to run right here today, they're learning a lot, learning about what parts they have built, the repairs, how they can do it, how they can do it better. But you hate as a crew chief to put your driver on the racetrack with a car that you can't take your time and prepare properly. You have to do the best you can on pit road. And you can see they got upset. They were mad because the, the cars came around and put them a lap down. They weren't able to get the car out. That's why you saw the crew members throw their hands up and they were upset because they weren't able to make the repair work and beat the cars out without getting a lap down. Front two are Ty Dillon and the 22 of Joey Logano. Here was what the three team had to say about the 22 on the radio. Next time we get in a situation with a 22 on our tail, uh, we're not going to wait till he gets clear. We're just going to clear ourselves leave him out after he did what he did to us. Yes, we was working together. I see it's all one-sided now. You listen to the spotter. Tab does that every time. I don't have time to listen to him. We just, we just know the deal now. You mean to tell me the drivers are getting disappointed that bonds were broken during a restricted play race? <laughs> I mean, this I love I love drivers Somebody, meetings. I love driver introductions. It's restricted play race. Everybody's all buddy buddy. I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> They're all liars. They're all gonna help themselves and do whatever's best for them. I'm gonna give Jeff Gordon credit here. We used to come to restricted plate races, and every meeting I was ever in, he'd look at his teammates and just say, you know what, I'm going to apologize right now, guys, because I can't be loyal. I have to do what I have to do, and I think that's what you see at a great restricted plate drivers. They push when they can, but in the end, it has to be about yourself. Marty, that car was up in the air the last time say, we saw it. It was flying through the air, wasn't it, Rick? A moment ago, last time we saw Austin Dillon. And yes, they have already fixed the car. He's back on the racetrack for this restart. Just incredible. I asked the team why. Well, of course, owner's points. Remember, they are third in the owner's championship standings, just a couple of points out of second. So Austin Dillon going to do the best he can to limp this car home. But amazing. A moment ago, flying through the air, now about to take the green flag. Austin Dillon scored six laps down. He's currently scored 32nd. Pace car about to make the hard left turn. He leaves the field in the hands of Joey Logano and the three of Ty Dillon. Back in the restart zone. Green flag back in the air. Who works the best together? Right now, David Reagan pushing the 22 of. Joey Logano on the high line. On the bottom of the track, Elliott Sadler in the one main financial number one, that blue and white car, pushing the three of Ty Dillon. Darrell Wallace Jr. in the six, too fast exiting pit road, so he had to come back to pit road, and they are three wide again. Thought for sure after that last couple accidents, Rick, that the pace would calm down. People would get a little more organized, two wide racing. But the drivers don't seem to agree with me. We're already three wide, only 28 laps into this race after some big accidents, still door to door action. But you know, you heard Ty Dillon when I talked to him during the red flag. He made the mention that this was a short race. And that's in everybody's mind. It's 100 lap race, there's 70 to go. 
I mean, this race is going to wind down quickly, so you want to have that track position. Even though it seems like it's a long way away, if you can get that track position now, maybe you can hold it and put yourself in position to win this race. Well, because no matter how good of a car you have, Jeff, as you mentioned, if you go back two or three rows into that three-wide racing, you're not going anywhere. You might as well be at a standstill on the interstate. There are no lines open. They're doing it 200 miles an hour, but if there's no room to race, you can't move forward. Collectively holding our breath because you just know that when they're three wide going around this racetrack, anything can happen. The slightest mistake can trigger a big, big accident. There's just no available real estate. If you make a mistake, if you move a little bit too much, if you don't anticipate your competitor moving, there's no room for error. Let's get a few updates from Pit Road. We'll start with Dave Burns. Rick, in February, the three car of Ty Dillon was one of the fastest. In fact, it was the fastest qualifier on the pole. Brought the same car here, but it qualified 11th. I asked the team what happened. They told me we needed drivability in our very fast race car. So they added the ability to maneuver, the ability to make moves to possibly get around cars to that package, and it qualified further back. But obviously, it's still very good if they can learn how to work with the 22. Marty. Well, they even count down to green. Dale Jarrett didn't hesitate to pick his former teammate, Elliot Sadler, to win this race. After all, Sadler won at Talladega in this race car. He was leading the final lap at Daytona in February in this race car. So he was very pumped up coming into this race. On that first run, he said the car was a little bit too loose. But he said, don't tighten it up too much. I'm afraid that'll take away our speed. Kelly. Marty Chase Elliott narrowly avoided getting caught up in that wreck. But even though they escaped that big one, the team knows they're not out of the woods yet. I think this race last year, we had three cars left running that didn't have damage. I was one of the three, and I had damage, so that, that, that's not right either. That's in four, then. No, I know it was, it was not pretty. It was not pretty. Well, when he came down pit road, they made a wedge adjustment, four tires and fuel for Chase Elliott. Mike? Kelly, talking to Justin Allgaier before the race, you could sense his confidence. He said this is the best super speedway car he's ever had. Asking him why, he said, well, I could just do everything with it. The car always listens and allows me to run any line on the racetrack. Problem, though, in that last caution, he got a little bit of damage on the front fascia. They did repair it on pit road, but the car is not exactly the same. Still feels like he's got a shot to get to the front, but clearly not the car he had when he began the race, Rick. We're watching Justin Allgaier, Junior Motorsports. What a season we have seen out of Justin Allgaier, as well as Elliott Sadler. Rick, this is why we saw all the competitors so aggressive after the restart, because you see they're starting to get organized in the bottom lane. And we have now seven, eight, nine cars single file in the bottom lane. So if you couldn't get up early, you're now losing spots. Chase Elliott did a great job gaining positions, but he's stuck in the high lane, the second car in the top lane. And as that falls back, he's losing that ground. He's looking for a place to go, and he's looking to push the car in front of him. But if the guys on that inside line stay disciplined and they stay in line and they're able to, to bump each other at the appropriate times, it's going to be hard to make that outside line work. That's one thing about all those cars being in these wrecks is that it slows that momentum down because there's less cars. Maybe a little debris on the front of the 22. You see that, Steve? Yeah, and you know, here when we come to Daytona and Talladega, you see that white piece of paper stuck to the nose of the 22 car. The grill opening, the amount of air allowed inside these race cars is limited by NASCAR to try to help reduce some of that pushing we've been talking about. So out front as the leader, Joey Logano perhaps is still getting enough air. I'm sure they're asking him his temperatures now, but he has to be very careful. One, if he gets back in the pack, it may blow off, but if it doesn't, there's definitely not going to be enough air when you get into the draft to keep the car cool. And that's a great point to bring up, Steve, because not only are these drivers looking out the front of the car, the windshield, but they're also looking out the mirror to see where the drivers are making their moves. They also have to look at their gauges. He's going to have to look at his gauges more often because they know now that there's a piece of debris, maybe some paper on the front. They don't want that thing to overheat. Yeah, in today's world, the gauges, they're, they're programmed. So if the water gets a certain temperature, the gauge will start flashing red. It'll first turn yellow, then it'll turn red, then it'll flash red. You can see all these gauges are white. So the gauges being white tells me he does not have an issue. You can hear in the background the radio they were talking about. They think it's a garbage bag that's on the front of that car. And they're hoping that it's okay. But of course, Joey Logano is going to have to keep his eye on the gauges to make sure it doesn't overheat. And, and to be honest, 
if it doesn't overheat, it's an advantage for the 22 car. It's almost like they put a couple pieces of tape on it. You have to remember, you have to apply tape to these cars for every situation, which means you can't add tape assuming you're going to lead because if you end up in the pack, you'll overheat. Joey Logano, the leader, that's going to reduce the drag. It's, act, it's like adding tape, like it's adding tape for qualifying. So if there's enough air, it, it could be a small advantage. But it also makes it so that he probably will, will be more aggressive. If he gets put in a, a position by the three of Ty Dillon, to, you know, T, Ty's going to try to make a move, I think he's going to block even harder because you don't want to get back in the pack with that tape on your nose. So you really want to fight hard for that track position. Mike, you have something on the 22? Yeah, I just spoke with Greg Irwin, who used to be the crew chief on the 22, now an advisor to Brian Wilson. He said they're not really concerned too much about the temperatures right now. Irwin believes that as long as they're out front, they're getting a lot of air on that front of that car. And uh, because of that, they're not terribly concerned at the moment. That's a good thing, as we are on lap 37 of 100. On the windshield of Joey Logano, the 82nd Airborne Division on this Independence Day weekend. Recognizing the different armed forces, battalions, different groups from all areas of the armed forces. It's Ty Dillon still tucked in behind the 22, all the way back to David Reagan in the 18, who was on the outside line, leading that outside line, trying to gain some momentum, using side drafting every now and then to bring the cars back. What happens to the outside line though is there's options. You know, we'll see the 18 and the 88 get a little organized, start making a little ground. But as soon as they do that, a car two, three, four behind it, we continue to see the white 14 pop out of line. And when he does that, while it might help him for a little bit, it hurts that entire lane. The opposite is the inside lane. They're pinned between the outside lane and that double yellow line. So Joey Logano, Ty Dillon, Elliott Sadler, Brendan gone, as long as they stay patient, committed to one another, they're taking the shortest way around the racetrack, very organized. And yeah, the outside lane, what it's going to need, it's going to need something to happen on the bottom. Like they get into turn three and they get too close together and they have a lift to keep from wrecking. That kind of thing is what it's going to require for the, bot for the top to get going. And we see that quite often. We see a guy get into the back of somebody, he's got to correct the car, gets loose, everybody's got a brake check, and now the outside line gets a run. So. Right now, I think that they're going to have to have some sort of scenario like that to make this outside work. And we saw the 33 of Brandon Jones a little bit slower on the high side of the track. Two lines going by him at Daytona.
Welcome back to the World Center of Racing as we're under the caution for the fourth time this evening. This time it was Ryan Priest in the 0-1. Looks like he had a mechanical issue. The engine went away on that. And so the field back under caution. He was on the outside line, which is always dangerous when you have smoke and something happening in those cars. Yeah, and everybody behind him did a great job. See the guys got away, and then obviously it was all on the racetrack right there, but the guys behind him did a really good job not to get into the back of him. Again, you're at Daytona. You you can't see very well in front of that car. You're just not expecting the car in front of you just to stop. Clear. Stay on there. Stay on there. Clear. Clear. He's still on the bottom. Stay up there. Caution's out. Caution's out. That was Daniel Suarez we were riding along with. He called it before it happened. Yeah. You can see a little bit of smoke coming out of the tailpipes, and he saw it, and he called it before it happened. Sometimes you can even smell it. You know, as that engine starts to go sour, starts burning oil, comes out of the exhaust. So Ryan Fries will bring that car to the attention of his crew. It will, I'm sure, go into the garage as they will look at that. NASCAR returns to NBC tomorrow night. The Sprint Cup Series hits the track for the Coke Zero 400, powered by Coca-Cola. Coverage begins on NBC at 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll take it from here. Tomorrow night, Rick, major chase implications. Just like tonight, we're seeing these accidents. Front running cars get taken out. It's going to be exciting under the lights. Dale Hart Jr. trying to make it. Chase Elliott trying to guarantee a spot. Kyle Larson without a win. A lot of excitement tomorrow night at Daytona. So when you have debris on your grill, you do anything you can to get it off. So you see he's rubbing the, the back car? of the <laughs> face car. Of course, I wouldn't want to. they charge him for the body repair? There it is. It's gone. gone. So you probably never actually touch the car in front of him, but just getting close to it changes the pressure, actually pulls the, pulls the piece of debris off the grill. Well, he'd have to bump draft. He couldn't push the pace. That's right. That's not allowed, but maybe you're allowed. You can't to lock bumpers. Can you bump? Can we get a review bump? of that to see if that was <laughs> Wayne Otten May black flag Joey Logano for trying to lock up with the pace car, that Camry. We have controversy under caution. This is a major point in the race, though, still as far still as. Still closed this lap. Still closed. Here, right there, reporting pit road still closed. You know. We're outside of the fuel window, 58 to go. So I don't think anyone's thinking, hey, I need to come down, get fuel because I can make it to the finish. But what they are thinking is, if you think you want to be aggressive with tires, put them on now. It'll set you up for later in the race. A lot of speedy drive still on the racetrack. They'll clean that up. We'll take a quick break. So appreciative of our armed forces, especially on this 4th of July weekend. A lot in attendance tonight. As the Xfinity Series continues to 
honor and say thank you to the men and women that continue to protect us home and abroad. And cars on pit road. We go down to Dave. Rick, crew chief Shane Wilson wants Brendan gone in the lead, thinks he can get him that by not changing Goodyear tires and going with fuel only. To his right, the three car of Austin Dillon, they'll go right sides only in fuel, Mike. And it's just a chassis adjustment, both track bar and wedge and fuel for the 22 car, no tires. Marty? Two tires for Elliott Sadler, who said the handling was perfect on his race car, but Kevin Mandring making the call for a wedge adjustment to keep up with a changing racetrack. Rick? Shane Wilson making the call and Brendan gone. Getting out in front, winning the race off pit road. And 10 left short. Welcome back to the NASCAR Xfinity Series Subway Firecracker 250, powered by Coca Cola. NASCAR Drive is NASCAR.com's live race day companion. Select your in car video or camera angle access, integrated driver stats, lap by lap commentary, social conversation in real time. You won't miss a lap when you visit NASCAR.com slash drive on your personal computer now. Take another look at what took place on pit road. This is the 22 of Joey Logano coming in for fuel only stop. Yeah, little things matter. You can see, clean the grill off. Watch the fuel man. He's shaking his head. Go, go, go. You're full. You're fuel. When he goes, the car stalls. Now he's got to refire it. He took no tires, but he did not gain the advantage he would have gained because he started leaving pit road. And track position, very important, even at Daytona, because you have to be able to figure out where in line you can move and where in line you have to stay. Yes, and we've seen a very rough, aggressive race tonight. You want to stay towards the front. Why? We did see one big accident off the front. Normally, the accidents are farther in the pack. Let's chat with one of our competitors, Brent Gaughan. Hey, Brent, it's Jeff Burton, uh, your crew chief, Shane Wilson. No tires. You feeling good about that strategy? Yeah, our tires are pretty good on eight, the South Point Chevy, and, and we, uh, we, we kind of had a plan from the start of the race. And, kind of working into what we thought. So I'm, I'm happy with no Goodyear tires. I think they're darn good today. So with what you've seen so far, how important do you think being in the front is? Do you think you'll be able to come from mid-pack to win the race, or do you need to be in the front? It's been pretty tough today. We came from 17th and moved our way to the top like eight that first run. 
but uh, it, it's, it's pretty tough today. These cars are stalling out pretty bad. So I'm, I'm happy with the view from the front and hopefully going to stay here. All right, well, good luck. We'll be watching. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. An honor to have the 23 SDS on the race car this week. Brendan Gaughan, an honorary member of the 23rd STS. And Rick, when Brendan said the Carls were stalling out, what he means basically is in the draft, there's kind of a accordion effect. Runs come and runs go, help comes and help goes. Really what these drivers are looking for when you get help, when a car pulls up behind you, how far can that run go? Does that momentum carry the entire backstretch? Does it carry past two or three cars? or does it give you a little bit of help and then stall out? And that's what Brendan's talking about, that you can get runs, you can get an advantage on your competitor, but it doesn't last a very long time. Let's see if there was frustration in the 22 pits. This was the radio when they had the problems on pit road. I can't figure out the damn clutch in this stupid thing. Every freaking week. Yeah, I copy that. We'll, uh, we'll definitely pay some attention to that and work on it for you. So you would think when, when you go to lead pit road, that'd be easy. But you have to remember, Joey Logano goes from a cup car to an Xfinity car. One has fuel injection, one doesn't. So these things are a little bit different. They accelerate a little differently. When you dump the clutch and you go to the throttle, if, if everything's not synced up just right, and some cars are harder than others for whatever reason, the gearing, those kind of things matter. If all that's not synced up perfectly, it'll stall the car. And obviously, this isn't the first time this happened, but it's very difficult to try to figure out how to fix it. Sometimes you can change stuff in the carburetor and the fuel injection on the cup car and make it better, but the gearing makes it that much harder too. And at Daytona, you have a high gear you know, on pit road. And sometimes it could just be the location of the pedals. You know, their feet are busy in there, as you well know, Jeff. You know, left foot on the clutch, right foot on the brake, heel towing, they have a lot going on. Sometimes it's just uncomfortable for a driver or a very sensitive clutch. Joy Logano will restart just behind Brendan Gaughan, and Joy Logano's been one of the best pushers already on restarts. We'll see if he Gives Brendan Gaughan a big shove as they go into turn number one. Elliott Sadler's on the high line. See how good of a restart he has. They come into the restart zone once again. Eric Almarola tucked in behind Elliott Sadler. Almarola in the 98. Ryan Reed in the 16, third on the bottom line. Here goes Joey Logano. Is he going to continue to help? No, he's going to hang Brendan Gaughan out, and he's going to go by for the lead. When Ryan Reed tried to go to the bottom of the 62. He had to stop that because had he gone below the yellow line and made that pass, he would have been penalized. Once again, Joey Logano, even with the mishap on pit road, back in front of the field at Daytona. Once again, we see two or three cars clear of the pack. The rest of the field, three by three. Through the tricky triangle, trioval, as they go through there and into turn number one. As you mentioned, three wide. Look at the tape coming off. Ty Dillon doing a little bit of a shove there. Oh, and another one around is going to hit the inside wall. That is the 19 of Daniel Suarez. Big damage to the front end of Daniel Suarez. He's going to put the window net down. This is one he can't drive back to the pit road or the garage. Yeah, put that window net down. Tells NASCAR rescue personnel that you're okay, but I promise you that hurt. That head on impact into that inside wall, even though it's a safer barrier in there, that's a hard impact, and I can promise you it hurt him. And, and they paved the backstretch, too. There used to be grass back there, and you could pick up speed, but that pavement at least scrubbed off a little speed. Let's take another look. Just so like might be contact between the two cars. It looks at this point that the tires are still up until they lock up. We can't see the left front. You see the right front blow there as it slides across the pavement. But right here, you're going to see a great shot of the impact. Watch the softball. Watch how much it deforms as that 19 hits it. You're going to see how it absorbs the energy right here. A big hit. Great weary hit. You know, a few farther feet down, that wall turns back out to allow the safety vehicles to come in and out. Luckily, he hit where he did. But it was great to see him drop the win in it, as you mentioned, Jeff. Yeah, I don't like that wall where it turns out like that. I wish the wall could continue straight and they move the inside wall. But you see right here, he got up the racetrack. I don't know if he had a problem. 
prior to that, obviously he had a, either had a tire going down or a handling issue. He got up the racetrack, got into the side of the car beside him, and that got him going in this direction. Big impact. Yeah. Again, you know, thank you to Daytona International Speedway for putting these safer barriers up all the way around the racetrack. Again, you cannot control where these cars are going to hit. They will find places in walls. It will find places to hit. Have to have those barriers. Right, right here. Outside. Right here. Two outside. He gets up the racetrack. Got a little bit loose. Had to chase Two up outside. the racetrack. Made a little bit of contact. That started this whole incident. You see him bring his hands into his belt so that his hands aren't on the steering wheel in case that steering wheel whips. It does these the wall. steering mechanisms in these cars over the years have become faster and faster. And what that means is when you lose control and the front tires go back and forth when you hit the wheel, that wheel can turn 180 degrees. And you would imagine the spokes in that steering wheel catching a thumb can easily break a hand or a finger. Very rare to see Daniel Suarez have to get out of the car and go to the infield care center. But the other time that he had his other DNF was here back in February of 2015 for an accident as we see just an all guard making it on the pit road Mike all guard taking on fuel it doesn't look like they're going to take tires he's pretty happy with the handling of that race car he's away Marty little strategy move for Elliot Sadler and Kevin Mandering here they're going to go left side tires for Sadler Murray took off right side tires last time and all the fuel that that that, that car could stand all the Sunoco fuel it could get they were about five laps short so they play this right get enough cautions they might be able to make it to the end Right here, it's a strategy here. It is a really aggressive strategy call. Elliott Sadler had decent track position. Kevin Mendry making an aggressive call on top of the picture. Remember, Elliott Sadler, he has a win. He's in the chase. Let's be aggressive. Let's try to win another race. Five cautions tonight before halfway. That's a record. We go NASCAR nonstop.
next Friday night on NBCSN Xfinity Series Racing from Kentucky. Coverage begins at 8 p.m. Eastern on NBCSN. Names are made here. Penske swept Kentucky last year with Brad Keselowski and Blaney. And take a look at tonight's Toyota driver update. David Reagan currently running fifth. Jeff Green is eighth. J.J. Yaley, 15th. And no disrespect to J.J. Yaley, but I would say it's a rare case that he makes it onto that list. It's just been a tough night for those Joe Gibbs racing Toyotas that normally dominate. Some some guys on pit road, Marty. Elliot Sadler among those. We talked about the call by Kevin Manring, the aggressive call. This is to top off to ensure not only can they make it all the way, but also if there's a green-white checkered at the very end of the race, they feel like now they'll be good for that as well. So a bold call by the one team. When you talk about commitment, Rick, that's a big commitment because now they were going to even start behind the lap down cars. They've gone all the way to the back. But it's interesting to see three junior motorsports cars come down pit road. Not just the one of Elliott Sadler. We saw the seven of Regan Smith, the 88 of Chase Elliott, all on pit road consistently. But that's one good thing is now they have drafting partners. And I like that strategy because there's been so many wrecks. We really don't have any cars that are like one lap down. We have cars that are three, five, six, seven, seven laps down, and they all have damage. So essentially, even though you're supposed to start behind them, you're probably going to start it, like you just came off pit road, the last car on the lead lap. And even the guy out in front is wondering what is going on with the strategy of the one. Here's what the 22 radio had to say. Oh, I'm assuming the story is the one can make it from here. We must be close. Yeah, copy that. We're, we're just discussing that right now. I mean, I still feel like they're not a guarantee that they can make it, but they're right on the edge of it. So, uh, that's, yeah, that's kind of the scenario right there. We're just a couple laps off of what they can do. That is the... I think we missed the strategy, <laughs> so we're not going to guarantee they can make it on fuel. Yeah. But to defend Joey Logano, there's still 48 laps to go. I like the aggressive pick call, but I agree with the 22. Stay out. Keep the track position. You're on the front row. This crazy race, I think that's where I'd want to restart. The junior Motorsports cars won both plate races already this year, trying to continue that sweep. Back into the restart zone. Green flag back in the air. Ty Dillon in the three, trying to give a little bit of help to the 22 of Joey Logano. We heard on the radio earlier, once you clear him, we're not worried about it. Eric Almarola in the 98. And that outside line, and Logano will jump in front of him. Joey's got a block. If he doesn't, he's going to get passed. So you're going to see Joey switch from left to right, trying to maintain this track position. He's a, he looks like to be in good shape right now. 98 came in behind him. Logano staying out front, Eric Almarola bump drafting. The two starting to separate themselves from the pack. Hearing that the 19 of Daniel Suarez checked and released from the infield care center after the most recent incident. Two Cup Series stars out in front of the field in the Xfinity Series. He saw he got a bad restart a little while ago, but now he's worked himself back up to third place. So even though he did not get a good restart, he's still in good shape. This would be a huge win for Joey Logano as we ride along looking back on the field. He has had four runner-up finishes. The Penske organization has had four runner-up finishes at Daytona, but has never won in the Xfinity Series at this track. And Joey Logano now leading. Eric Almirola all over his back bumper. And as I just mentioned, Suarez coming out of the infield care center. Let's go to Kelly. Yeah, he's just been released. And after that nasty hit, Daniel, but how did it happen? Well, um, everything has started before the competition caution when, when uh, everyone got crazy super early and we got involved in the back straight away. The car wasn't right after that. We were just trying to, you know, make some laps and trying to save some points. The car wasn't right. The car was just super tight. I wasn't able to go anywhere. And at that point, I was just in the middle of uh, and the three wide. I was in the bottom, but when somebody was on my right side, my car was getting super, super tight. Uh, I don't know who, who was the guy that was on my outside. And obviously, he, he didn't know that, but 
when he got very close to me, I got super tired, and then I felt like I, I, I barely touched him, and then I, I just spun out. It's, it was not a lot I was able to do in that point. I was pretty much able, I was trying to just survive, to try to make some adjustments and try to, I don't know, maybe get a top 10, a, a top 20 out of this, but how it works sometimes in a super speedway. Good news for him, he already has that win to get in the chase, Rick. Yeah, that win coming at Michigan two races ago. Look back about five cars and you see the 39 of Ryan C. Ryan C. Always finding speed and running well at super speedways. Yeah, Ryan Sieg, and we've seen there's several cars here, lower funded teams. Ryan Sieg does a really good job every week, gets the most out of his equipment. You can see him right here in the green and black 39 car. They do a really good job, and what they have, they they really are doing a good job. And then the 21, you know, right behind him, Gallagher. There's not a team that's greatly funny. You don't see them running in the front a great deal of time, so they're having a good night. These, all these accidents have created an opportunity for some of these guys we typically don't see running in the front. Let's see if one of them take advantage of it. Yeah, when you talk about Ryan Seek, 11th in points, plus 19 over the cut line. Remember, yep. a chase has changed the dynamic of the Xfinity Series, where this driver would be 175 points out of the lead at this point in the season. Currently, he knows if he can stay in that top 12, he's going to make the chase. Having some technical difficulties, we will take a quick break and we will be right back with more action from Daytona. And welcome back to Daytona International Speedway. Sorry for those technical issues. As we continue on with the Subway Firecracker 250 powered by Coca-Cola. 40 laps of racing to go. A quick race, 100 laps, 250 miles. And it goes very fast when they're going nearly 200 miles an hour around this track. Out in front, Joey Logano, Eric Alvarola. Ty Dillon, David Reagan, Ryan Sieg still running in the top 10, but that second line, that outside line led by Brendan Gone, making up some room now. Got a big run down the back straightaway off the turn three. Let's see if they can keep that momentum. A lot of times you'll get a big run, but then the inside, the energy on the inside line overwhelms you and pulls back out. Let's see if Brendan can keep it up. Brendan closing in on the fourth position. Brendan has Ryan Reed, you know, a guy we've seen win this race before. So Ryan Reed has worked himself into position. He's a guy back behind Brendan pushing. A little bit of bump drafting. One of the cars that you don't see up in the front any longer is the one of Elliott Sadler. What's going on with him, Marty? Yeah, the one car not in that lead pack, Rick. And it's funny, he and the spotter, Brett Griffin, were having a conversation before this restart. Do we be aggressive? Do we be conservative? And Elliott came on the radio and said, I'm going to be aggressive unless it gets crazy. And about three laps into this run, he said, it's a little too crazy. He backed out. They told him he's good on fuel, and he's about to pick up his teammate, Chase Elliott, as a drafting partner. You see him right up there in that 88 car, that blue and gold car. That's going to help him out tremendously. So Elliott Sadler kind of pacing himself right now, trying to get back to that lead pack, and again, has fuel to make it to the end. One of the few in the field that does. I think that's the key, Rick. Elliott Sadler can be very patient back in 25th because he knows 
he has more fuel than the majority of the competitors in front of him. There's no reason to put himself in a position to, to crash. He needs a yellow to, to get the track position. Everyone have to pit but him. And if it goes green, they'll have to pit with a few laps to go, and he'll get his track position then. The 18 of David Reagan also thinking about fuels. We're seeing Brendan gone get shuffled out on that high line, and he will start to fall back. But the 18 of David Reagan, this is what they have to say on the radio. That's saving fuel when you only have to be at 65 or 70 percent and you're running in the fourth position. Well, he's in the best spot to save fuel. He's got a car behind him. He's got cars in front of him. So he's got the draft from the cars in front of him taking air off his car. He also, also has the cars behind him taking air off his car. And with those being in between those cars, you don't have to run full throttle. You can run partial throttle and still stay in that position. So somebody can save fuel. He's in a good position to do it. How about Eric Jones taking that Toyota? Back up into the middle of the pack after wrecking earlier. He's still on the lead lap and still running well. Never quit. Keep trying, never quit. You never know what can happen. Been in two wrecks already, but still out here with a shot. Question is do some drivers think about saving fuel and trying to make the run? other than Elliot Sadler who we know came on the pit road later than everyone else to well, put fuel in even if you don't though the, the beauty of saving fuel what David Reagan's doing right here is every bit of fuel he saves is less fuel they'll need to put in if they do come down pit road so the pit crew the crew chief can be very aggressive shorten his final pit stop perhaps either save track position or gain a little bit more track position such an impressive run as we were mentioning earlier for David Reagan who's trying to save a little bit of fuel fourth car back in that line and again David Reagan in the seat of that car because of the fact that Matt Tiff had brain surgery today normally the driver of the 18s we ride along with Ty Dillon who's currently third and what a great view you know riding along with Ty Dillon you know what he's doing is he's playing really close attention to the car behind him and the car in front of him. You cannot let the car behind you get a good run on you. You got to block that bottom. Make sure you do not give him an open on the bottom. If he passes you on the outside, he passes you on the outside. But stay right against that yellow line, getting into the corner, down the straightaway. Ever, everywhere you go, stay against that yellow line. Every time I see this shot, Rick, the vision amazes me. How that car, as he closes in on that car in front of him, how much of his view's blocked. Ty has a pretty good view in the corner. He can kind of look past the left front of the car in front of him. But right here, as he enters the straightaway, even in the trioval, he can't look past the 98 of Eric Almirola. All he sees is the big back black spoiler on that car. And that spoiler blocking his vision. All he knows is to get up to the back bumper, bump, and try to stay right up with. Almirola, who's currently here. running second and around goes okay. to 15. Caution Ryan Ellis here. slides sideways. The right rear goes down. Ellis was running in the 10th spot. Left side flick up. Right side down. Okay. Get it back here, guys. Right away. Walk it in. Ryan Ellis, a 26 year old out of Aspern, Virginia. And he will bring out the sixth caution of the night. A little bit of debris falling off of that car. Needs to stay down on the apron. See Ryan Ellis on the bottom of the racetrack. Everything looks normal and calm right there. She gets a little bit loose, get in the corner, but everything seemed to settle down. Hit the bobbies. He had a tire going down. You saw the big sparks come out of the car. Tire was going down. Car got lower to the racetrack. Did a really good job of not hitting anything. So really doesn't have any damage. I don't think the, the splitter ever hit very hard. I, I think he's in pretty good shape. Again, when you spin at Daytona in front of cars, you don't have major contact. You consider yourself lucky. Get on pit road, put some tires on, and get going. Well, he did a good job. You just see right here, keeping it down the racetrack. If he, right there, when he tries to overcorrect, it shoots back up. He somehow did it, got the wheel back to the left, kept it on the bottom half of the racetrack, avoiding those cars above him. Free pass is going to go to the 25 of Scott Legacy Jr. We look again from up above. What took place with Ryan Ellis? Yeah, that right rear tire going away on him. Yeah, no question. 
again, a really good job. You know, just getting on the apron like Steve just said, not letting the car get up the racetrack, hitting the outside wall. Another close call for Eric Jones, right along with him. You're going to see right here how important it was for Ryan Ellis to stay on the bottom because the car is five. Go by him on the outside right there. The 20 was in a very bad situation. If that car comes up the racetrack, the 20's collected, and there's really nothing Eric Jones could do. And look at these guys. I mean, they did a nice job of not panicking. Eric slows down. Now he sees it. Now he throttles up to try to get away from him. Good job by everybody. It was a Kyle Busch moment. I remember Kyle Busch yeah. a few times here at Daytona had that same sort of save. And this caution creates an opportunity for some people. What is Elliott Satter going to do? Is he, are, you other, are other people going to pit and Elliott Satter stay out? Be interesting to see the strategy plays right here. Or do some think that they can make it even when they came on 44 by just saving fuel? A lot are making the decision to come to pit road now. Dave. Including Ty Dillon, it will be Sunoco fuel only for him. As long as he doesn't slide the tires, that's his job now. It's pit road well, Mike. 22 car has not changed left side tires all night long, and they won't do so here either. Right sides only in fuel on Logano's car. Meanwhile, Eric Almarola, fuel only, a 3.6 second stop. He's away, Marty. Sunoco fuel, no Goodyear tires for David Reagan. Chris Gale said, go on me. They waited until it was full where they needed it to go. Send him back out on pit road. Ty Dillon wins the race off pit road, but the junior motorsports cars stay out. And that will give them the advantage. Time now for tonight's Subway Fresh Take. Let's start with Marty Snyder. Well, fuel is not a concern for Elliot Sadler and Kevin Mandering, but now you've got all your junior motorsports teammates over there. How comfortable does that make you? Oh, it's definitely great to have your teammates up here. The one main Chevy's been fast all night. Uh, we should be good to make it to the end on fuel, so we kind of put ourselves in position here to race for the win, and Elliot's doing a great job. Not sure that's the position he wants to put Elliot Sadler in, a man who's won restrictor plate races already this year, Dave. 
And Nick Harrison trying to guide Ty Dillon to his first win of the season. That would be huge for you guys. How good is the race car? Uh, the race car is real good. He's been conservative all night. Uh, just trying to keep him in position here where we can strike and get a victory. We're long overdue and uh, would love to put the Bass Pro Chevy. Got NRA on the side and uh, these guys are way overdue on a victory, uh, Ty especially. Thanks, Ty. Uh, Kelly? Barbara is the crew chief for Darius Wall Darrell Wallace Jr., who was involved in that early wreck. You guys have just worked and worked on this car. Now you're in position to go for the win. How much car do you have left to do that? I'm uh, not quite sure right now. You know, we, uh, we're we good, good to the end on fuel, and these guys have worked really hard all day. And But obviously, we got a lot of damage, so we'll find out right here what we've got left. All right, thank you. Again, Darrell Wallace Jr., one of the early cautions he was involved in. Justin Allgaier, Darrell Wallace Jr., Chase Elliott, Elliott Sadler, Ty Dillon, the top five. Joey Logano back there in the 22. This is what they had to say on the radio. Oh, we're plenty good from here, right? Yes, sir. Plenty good right there. Um, we're one of the only guys that did tires at that point, so you got better, better tires than everyone. And uh, at this point, you can turn your heat on. So far. Explain that to me, crew chief. You can turn your heat on. <laughs> well, hey, crew chief. Uh, does, yeah, does a I'm driver want to turn his heat on? I hope he's talking intensity. We never had a heat switch in any of my race cars, but if it's his right foot and the steering wheel, then I think <laughs> the heat's been turned on for most of the race watching Joey Logano. Darrell Wallace Jr. needs a Now in the Xfinity Series, a great opportunity for him to run for a championship and in a very good position now went for a wild ride early can he stay out front i think he's got a good shot i think he's got the one car behind him he's a great pusher so we'll see what happens there but i don't like the damage on his car as the leader you know with the car with damage i don't like the first car to have damage on the front of the car so i don't like the position he's in i'd rather for him to be in the second row of the third row so chaotic behind the wheel and to be in the middle of all of the action taking place at Daytona, we're going to actually listen in to TJ Major spotter for Justin Algar on the restart as they come through the zone. Green, green, green. There you go, he's coming. All right, buddy. So pushing out, he's coming up on the six can, come up on the six. He's got to run. All right, make sure that idiot helps you. The six is out there. The one's pushing the boy out here. Outside the one. Outside. Outside, big push here. Outside door, the one's getting help now. He's getting help. Lined up outside, they're pushing out there. <laughs> they're tandeming out there. Outside, lined up. Outside, still there. Still outside, still outside. He's clear by one up there in front of him. Come to that 98 quick there. Lined up real tight in front of you now. Still lined up outside. Still 20 is going to push that 22 to the front there. Lined up outside. And Justin Algar started on the inside of the front row and now is four cars back in that inside line. And isn't it surprising we talk about visibility. TJ Majors gave Justin Algar information not only to his right behind him but even in front of him. He let him know how tight they were lined up in front of him. We could talk about visibility. Justin Algar cannot see the 98 of Eric Amarola or the one of Elliott Sadler up there. So he has to know if he needs to lift to get off the, the rear bumper of Darrell Wallace Jr. in front of him. Yeah, Eric Amarola, you know, we've seen him win here in a cup car. He is definitely a guy that can win this race, but look on the outside line. Look at the run you got going there. See if they can clear him. Eric Jones pushing the 22 of Joey Logano. Will Logano stay with Eric Jones if they do get by the one in the 98, but they're not going to this time. And now Eric Jones jumps in to that lower line. Logano trying to do the same. Oh, that's tight. And below the yellow line, but that was to avoid an accident. He didn't pass anybody down there, so there will be no penalty for that. Did not advance their position by going below the yellow line. No penalty. That was a position where they had to go down there, or 
he could have hooked the 22's bumper and sent him around. And it got so tight because there was a hole open and you saw the 20. He tried to get into it of Eric Jones. He tried to get into that hole he did. And then Legato, he had to try to squeeze into that hole. So that caused a lot of energy to come out of that line. People had to lift and brake check. That's why you saw that. 26 laps to go at Daytona. Elliott Sadler out in front. Sadler already a winner this year. His most recent win came at Talladega, but right behind him, Eric Almarola, Mike. And Rick, you've got to wonder if some of that home state magic will work out for Almarola once again. He's a young man who grew up in Tampa, Florida, and got perhaps his biggest NASCAR win right at this racetrack back in 2014, a rain short and sprint cup series race that gained him a berth to the chase. Now, obviously, he's looking for another win here tonight. Feels like he's got a very good race car, suffered some very minor damage in one of the earlier incidents, but right now the balance is very good. They took fuel only on that last stop. It feels like obviously they can make it to the end. The question is, can they get by the one and hold off the 22 at the same time? 25 to go, the last 25% of this race. Six cautions already. 14 lead changes between 10 different drivers. The most recent now, Elliott Sadler out in front. We saw how aggressive these drivers got early in the race. Imagine how aggressive they're going to get now as we get closer to that checkered flag. And we saw that. The outside line has not been the way to go. So we saw Joey and Eric work exceptionally hard to get to the bottom. Now these guys on the outside, led by Chase Elliott, they're in the same position. They're looking for a hole. They're looking for somewhere to go. But no one on the bottom is going to let them in if they can avoid it, they can help them. Chase Elliott in the 88 on that outside line, but it's the lower line. Elliott Sadler on the bottom. We go NASCAR now. NASCAR returns to NBC tomorrow night. The Sprint Cup Series hits the track for the Coke Zero 400, powered by Coca-Cola. Coverage beginning on NBC at 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll take it from here. And coming up right after the race, it's our post-race coverage. Featuring Chris Tavota, Kyle Petty, and Hall of Famer Dale Jarrett. Plenty of action still in front of us as we have 20 laps to go. 
Elliott Sadler out front, but the outside line starting to gain some momentum. Yeah, I'm wondering who's going to see that outside line starting to gain momentum and jump out in front of them as they continue to advance. It gives you an opportunity. Joey Logano, for example, if he thinks the 88 of Chase Elliott can keep going, he sees that momentum turn right and get in front of him, become the leader of that outside line. There it is. That's the move right there. Joey Logano thinks it's going to work, and they shuffle behind him just a bit. Now Logano, can he take that 22 to the front with a little bit of help from Chase Elliott? The ones trying to block, he just couldn't do it. They had so much momentum, there's no way he could get in front of him. Good move by Logano, getting in front of that outside line at the perfect time. Joey Logano brings Chase Elliott along with him. Elliott moves up to second. Logano the leader, and now Ty Dillon on the outside of the one. Elliott Sadler. That outside line started working because the inside line, you can see the cars getting up the racetrack. The six car could not hang the bottom. It started slowing everything down, and that's why the outside worked. Mike? You know, as we watch Joey Logano, you have to recognize that restrictor plate racing has certainly become one of his strongest. Whoa, a little bit of contact there, almost as he ran the 88 car down the racetrack, and it looks like he's getting sucked back. This is not what he had planned. He had been listening to Tab Boyd, his spotter, the whole time, tried to play the block, and it obviously had an adverse effect as he falls back in traffic. Big mistake right there, Mike Massaro. Big mistake by Joey Logano, trying to come back down and block, but there was too much momentum for Chase Elliott. Yeah, he thought he had him cleared. He thought he could run down the racetrack and get in front of him, but he was so far to the inside, he did not have a good view of it. So everybody did a great job of not having a wreck right there. You have to block. You have to try to block. He mistimed it. He didn't judge it correctly. But if you don't try to block in this race, you will not win it. Chase Elliott, we mentioned, wanting to complete the sweep at Daytona. So here's a replay. Joey Logano is committed to the top. It makes a late move to block the bottom right here and forces Chase Elliott below the double yellow line. Now that is an out of bounds line. NASCAR is reviewing this. In my opinion, Chase Elliott was there. He was inside the 22. He had no choice. He was forced below the double yellow line. I don't see that as a penalty. NASCAR will review it. They'll have to make a ruling. But that's what is very difficult when that subjectivity comes into these races. But it looked to me like the 22 forced the 88 below the line. No question he was forced below the line. And no question he advanced his position below the yellow line. So it puts NASCAR in a difficult spot. But without a doubt, he was forced there. Joey Logano all over the back bumper of Ty Dillon. And we've heard from NASCAR, they agreed that the 22 forced the 88 below the yellow line. The penalty for the 22 is he lost the spots. There's no extenuating circumstances for him, but the 88's pass was clean. That's a Chase Elliott out in front. Elliott won this race in February. Kelly, what's happening with Chase? Well, Chase started 15th, but felt much better about the car that he'd have here for the race. He said, I think it's strong enough to make a lane move, and that's really what matters. But this hasn't been a faultless race for Chase. They've had a couple of miscues on pit road, a couple of slow stops. They've had to change up their strategy a bit. Chase even kind of kicking himself, saying, I got to get my act together back down here on pit road. Well, he's done it, and now he is in contention to complete the sweep of Daytona, which would be quite an accomplishment. Yeah, and Kelly, we've seen Chase Elliott take the blame, say, I've got to get better, I've got to do better. We've also seen him find a way to the front of these races. You know, he does such a good job of self-analyzing. People think it's self-doubt. It's not self-doubt. It's analyzing, learning how to be better. He expresses it, but when the chips are down, he can deliver. There is no doubt about it. 2014, Chase Elliott, the champion in an Xfinity Series. Now he's ready, racing in the Cup Series as we continue NASCAR nonstop.
saw the pass on NASCAR nonstop when Chase Elliott was trying to block the high line and then the low line and then got shuffled right through the middle and that puts David Reagan out in front Eric Almarola running second. You can see Chase he tried to get up the racetrack to block the 98 of Amarola but Amarola had already gotten there so in trying to make that block he actually got himself slowed down because the 98 side draft him and instead of staying on the bottom and, and ended up too wide he tried to block and now he's worked his way all the way to the back so just a little bit of a missed timing on that block. And Almarola had the lead but it was the momentum of David Reagan on the outside that was able to take that top spot away. And so now David Reagan out in front of the field at Daytona. Yeah Rick we're seeing a lot of repaired cars running well we see uh, Darrell Wallace Jr. up in fifth and in fourth we have Eric Jones the right rear quarter panel of Eric Jones has been completely replaced but in the last few laps we've seen it start to flap loose I don't think it's doing any damage to the car but it's kind of hanging out other drivers are probably noticing it hopefully it'll stay attached for the final 10 laps. And we hope that Matt Tift has been able to join us on the broadcast and enjoy watching this. Matt Tiff just had brain surgery today. He would normally be driving the 18 and here is a tweet. Matt is out and doing well. He's on the road to recovery. We'll update you all in the morning. Thank you for the prayers. Yes. But Matt Tiff normally behind the wheel of the 18. David Reagan taking over the driving duties as there was a brain tumor for Matt Tiff. For Matt Tift, he had to have brain surgery today. Marty? And Rick, just amazing that he was literally out of surgery within the hour before this race started and in recovery right now. They said he'll be recovering throughout the evening. But David Reagan told me he wanted to do Matt proud this evening. Matt's name is still on the door of that race car. He said, this is Matt's car. It's not my car. The one thing he told me before the race, and Jeff, you can talk about this. He said, I don't know a lot of Xfinity Series drivers, so I'm going to be very patient today, learning drivers' tendencies. I know the Cup guys, but I don't know these guys very well. You could see him being patient in the field this evening waiting to make his move and did it at the right time didn't he yes he did Marty and you know it's in not knowing the drivers you don't know their tendencies you don't know how aggressive they're going to be how much you have to block them how much they're going to try to block you are they going to side draft you real hard you don't know all those things so you kind of got to take it easy and just take your time and don't make mistakes he's done a great job of getting himself in position and you know you feel bad for Matt Tiff he had an opportunity to drive a Joe Gibbs Xfinity car that's the best in the business and he had this unfortunate tumor so let's hope he does well continues to improve the pressure's building I mean it's nine to go and you're going to have any move you make now that's a wrong move can bite you. You've got it. you got for these front guys. I think they have to be patient. I think they still have to wait just a little bit. Did you say patience? I think you have to. I think you've got to just just chill. Make yourself not make a move too early. Look at everything. Realize you still have time to make a move. It's a hundred and ninety mile an hour game of chicken. Who's going to pull out first? Because if you pull out and no one goes with you, you go to the back like Chase Elliott did. Can the 20 win it from fourth? Does he think he has enough? Bubba Wallace Jr. back in fifth. Is that the position he wants to be in? But can he improve before the last lap? Somebody is going to make a move on the outside. You're going to see some cars get together. Slow momentum is going to create an opportunity for somebody to jump up on the outside and try to pick up Brendan Gaughan. But there just aren't enough people on that outside to work, in my opinion. Unless something happens, I think it's going to be one from this front four cars. Inside of seven laps to go. Drivers that need a win. Darrell Wallace Jr. just outside of that top four. He is running currently fifth. Justin Allgaier in the seven. He's currently sixth. Ryan Reed in the 16 is seven. And then Ryan Sieg just behind them in the 39 is eight. So in the outside line, Brendan Gaughan is being pushed by Joey Logano. That if you have somebody that can push you, can knock you to the front. I think Joey's the guy that you would want all day long. We've seen he knows how to do it. He knows how to build that energy. So if it's going to work, I think it's the best opportunity is right now. And as they move forward, though, Jeff, you mentioned the panic. They're almost to Ryan Reed. He needs a win to make the chase. Does he pull out a line to go to the outside? We've seen the seven of Justin Algar looking for the win as well. Win. Someone is going to pull out a line and jump up the front of that outside train. And this is it. It's starting to move right now. He got a big run getting into the corner. You see the 39 of Sieg pulled up the racetrack, side draft, it slowed that momentum down. Still out front. The top three have all won at restrictor plate racetracks. Reagan, Almarola, and Sadler. Eric Jones, after being involved in an accident, still running in the top four. Almost has a parachute, it looks like, in that right rear fender, sticking out 
Definitely at a racetrack like this, everyone talks about aerodynamics, but when you're in the draft, it definitely can help if you've got people behind you and in front of you. Yeah, this is not helping. You see three wide in the outside line. That is not what they need. They need to get double, they need to get nose to tail. Three wide will kill the energy. And then now they're starting to get it sorted back out. But every lap that goes by, when you make those little mistakes, it builds, it loses the opportunity for you to get this win. Time's running out. Five laps to go from Daytona. Down the back stretch. The inside line still working. But moving around a lot now is Eric Almirola, Elliot Sadler, Eric Jones, all chasing after David Reagan. That outside line just not getting the momentum they need. Legato decides to get out of line with Brendan Gaughan. Yeah, it getting, doesn't help. It's getting ugly back there. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me to see a caution come out from everybody trying to make that outside work. You can see they were three wide. Uh, cars moving around a lot. Under four laps to go. Just over 10 miles. Look at this view right here. Watch Joey Logano. He looks in the mirror more than he does out of the front windshield. He's checking the mirror. You have to drive. You have to block. You have to do everything you can. Oh, spin. Got a caution. We're going to have a caution as they spin behind. This time it's the 92, excuse me, 93. That's David Starr in the 93 around, and the caution comes out again. It looks as though we'll go overtime. And everything, try to get her going here, man. David Starr in the 93 around. Sorry. This is the seventh caution. Push start me, push start me. He might not realize that he doesn't have a back bumper to be pushed. See David Starr on the inside as he entered turn three. He got loose on the inside of the 14. He just couldn't get away from him and chase the race car, spun in front of the four. Nowhere Brendan Poole can go. Don't know if he had a tire going down, had some, some sort of an issue, but they entered turn three really close together. I don't know if he was pulling the air off the 93 and he couldn't get away from him, couldn't turn. See how close they are? Benny Gordon in the 14. And then nowhere to go for Brennan Poole. He tries to go up the racetrack, but gets caught up as David Starr went up the racetrack. Here's riding along with Ty Dillon. And it happens right in front of him. So the four and the 93 got together. That was, that was what happened. The four and the 93 got together on the straight, and that pushed. That pushed the 93 up into it. And then the fourth collected there as the 93 slid sideways down the racetrack. Ross Chastain behind the wheel of the four. So as comfortable as David Reagan could feel out in front, no more comfort. No, Rick, but let's remember back to lap 52 when Elliott Sadler, Darrell Wallace Jr., Jelson Algar, their crew chiefs called in the pit road to top off for a green-white checker, and here we are at a green-white checker. That might be the difference to give these guys enough fuel. We'll be back for the restart after this.
This race was scheduled to go 100 laps, but because of the caution coming out and we have completed 98 laps, this will be the 99th lap completed. We will, in essence, now be going into overtime. And the way overtime works in NASCAR is once they get to the start finish line and the green flag comes out, as long as the leader makes it all the way through turns one and two, down the back stretch and to the overtime line in a green flag condition, then the race will be completed with the next flag. If the next flag would be a caution, the field would be frozen and who's ever out in front would be the race winner. If they are able to continue on under green flag conditions all the way to the finish line, it will be a crazy race to the finish at Daytona, which normally it always is. Oh, so we only have to make a half a That should be easy. What's a half a lap? <laughs> My goodness, as crazy as these restarts are, I think that could be a challenge that we've seen time and time again, these restarts, the front four cars, every restart seems more aggressive with the bump, the push. Am I connected? Am I not? I think this is going to be no different. Now, most of the restarts, we've seen some patience off turn two, letting one another go. With only two laps to go, it's going to be interesting to see how much farther they dare take that tandem bump draft down the backstretch. Let's listen in to David Reagan's team as far as what they plan to do as they get ready for this restart. One, some of those cars are going to be real close on field here. I think they're probably fine for this first restart, but I don't know if they will be for the next one. Yeah, well, hopefully it only takes one, and uh, we do what we need to do. 10-4. So they're already thinking about the possibility of some of the cars maybe running out of fuel. But as long as they stay out in front of them, they would be OK if they can get to that that overtime line prior to someone bringing out a caution. But well, and the concern with that, Rick, is if one of those cars we see uh, Darrell Wallace Jr. running on the flat, trying to make sure the fuel pickup and the fuel cell stays full of fuel, even if they have fuel to run. When the driver goes to wide open throttle, brings the fuel demand up on the engine, increases it instantaneously on this restart. If there's any sort of air in the fuel system, the car will stumble. And we've seen how tight this pack racing is. If one of these cars stumble, that's all it's going to take to bring a caution out, and we'll have another attempt. And you're already seeing Elliott Sadler make his way onto pit road. And we thought Elliott Sadler came to pit road, one of the latest cars, so that they would have enough fuel. Initial procedure here. Can we get it started? Uh, we just can't leave until we got four PSI of fuel pressure. Just make sure we got good fuel pressure before you leave the box. Marty? And guys, they thought they were actually very much to the good, Kevin Mandering. In fact, Brett Griffin told Elliot Sadler a moment ago, we should be fine here on fuel, but we called, said it was a gutsy call by Kevin Mandering. As you heard on the radio, they need four PSI of fuel. They're also spraying some right directly into the cow so they can try and get as much uh, fuel in there, but still sitting here and it's not fired yet for Elliot Sadler losing valuable time. And there goes a shot at the win, guys. Yeah, Marty, if he, leave, if he tries to leave pit road, there's no rush right here, so it's, this isn't difficult. If you try to leave pit road with more than four or five PSI of, of fuel pressure, you it will just stall out. It'll, it'll run for just a minute, you'll get out of your pit box, and it'll shut off. And then you don't have fuel pressure. So you have to have patience. You have to sit there, fire the engine, let it run for just a second, build that fuel pressure, and then leave. The six of Darrell Wallace Jr. was not keeping up with a cautious pace or the pace car, and so he has to fall in line where he was when he fell behind that pace car pace. And let's listen to the radio about what they had to say about that. Back behind a couple cars here. Hold on. I'm maintaining pace when the one stopped in front of us. I'm working on it here. Hold on. They're saying inside line behind the seven. I'll let you know. Oh, my God. Darrell Wallace Jr., driver needing a win. And now, David Reagan, Eric Almarola making up row one. Pace car making its way off of the racing surface. Back in the restart zone. Green flag back in the air. We are in overtime. Sponsored by Credit One.
Through one and two, four cars packed together. Very tight as they go down the back stretch, racing for the overtime line. Three wide now as they go into three and four. David Reagan still out front. Very top momentum, very top. Big block That's right there. Ryan C had a big move on the outside. David Reagan made the block. Did what he had to do. Now let's see if Ryan C can push him. Eric Everall on the bottom being pushed by the seven. Justin Allgaier in the seven, just below. The 98, Eric Alvarola out in front. David Reagan dropping back a few spots. Justin Allgaier giving a shove to Eric Alvarola and into the wall goes David. David Reagan slamming into the wall. Darrell Wallace Jr. quick across the inside wall. The caution has not come out. The race is still on. Justin Allgaier on the high side. Eric Alvarola on the bottom of the racetrack. Turn four, and the caution will come out. Now we'll have to go back to video to find out who was in the lead when the caution light came out. When NASCAR does, when to throw the caution, they evaluate it, they knew the wreck was on the back straight away, they knew that if, if they went back to the start finish line, they could get slowed down before they got there, but they must have seen something on the back straight away. They felt like they had to roll safety personnel, and that's why they threw the caution when they did. Blake Cook, the 11 stopped. Quite a few cars involved in the accident. Benny Gordon in the 14 also involved again. And now it's up to NASCAR. We will look at the video. They will look at the video. The second that the caution light comes on, the field is frozen. Whoever is in front, whether it be Justin Allgaier or Eric Almarola, will be deemed the race winner. Absolutely, Rick, and that's the key. We don't use time and lines to, to figure out the finish. NASCAR uses a frozen field technique. That means they have to go back to the video, sync it up with the caution lights to be absolutely sure. We saw this at Talladega. This is what happens. But Jeff, you said it the best. How do they determine to put the caution out? They had to wait. They had to analyze the situation, see what they had on the back stretch. Something told them they needed to put it out. They did. And now we're going to have to see who is out front. And it looked like they wanted to let them race back to the start finish line. They didn't immediately throw the caution. They wanted to try to get them back over here and get them back to the line to have a race back. But again, they, they, the safety of the drivers comes first. They, they had to see something. They analyzed it. They decided we had to roll safety personnel, and that's why the caution came out. Just like everyone at home, just like us right now, we want to know who won. Well, how about the seven? Listen into his audio. They don't know. We will show replays. We will let you see it as well. When the caution lights come on, and then NASCAR will determine which car is in front, the 7 of Justin Allgaier or the 98 of Eric Almarola. And again, it's a safety situation. NASCAR would have loved to have seen this race go all the way to the finish line to determine who wins the race. In this situation, they deemed it wasn't going to be safe if they raced all the way back and the safety crews couldn't get out to the accident. Let's take a look. Riding along with Joey Logano. You saw the yellow light come on. We're going to slow that down and take another look, but they were almost door to door, wheel to wheel when the caution light came out. Almarola and Justin Allgaier. It's a tough position for everybody. You know, the drivers want to end at the start-finish line. The fans want to end at the start-finish line. But again, I'm never going to say NASCAR, in the interest of safety, should, should do something other than err on the side of caution. See, the light's green. It's still green. So we're slowing it down. Light's still green. Light is still green as we look forward to the next one. Now it's off in yellow. And right there, how do you determine from this view? That is so close between Allgaier 
and Albarola. I say the 98. It like to me the 98 was a little further ahead. Not yep. But to your but point, Rick, that view is very, very difficult. And this is what NASCAR has to take in mind. Multiple camera views, sync up all the cameras, see if there's a better shot. This is gigantic for these two race teams. Right. Think about the seven. Justin Allgaier trying to make the chase. One of the things that they're going to use, the technology they're going to use, is every camera is synced up time code wise. So the camera that we just showed, that vantage point, they will sync this up the time code of when it went to yellow. And you see up in the right hand corner, green light goes out. When the yellow light comes on right there, they'll sync that up with the other cameras and they can look from a different perspective that will hopefully give them a better view of who was in front when the yellow light came on. By that view, I think the seven. So I've given two opinions in a matter of ten, one minute. So you pick, <laughs> let me get this straight. So you picked the two cars that were out front. Well, I can't yeah. be wrong. There you oh, go. Oh, wait a minute. There you go. Yes. Off the top, Fred Biazzi. Way to call fuel only, buddy. Eric Almarola, the 98. Almarola wins at Daytona again. The officials are holding them, even though the celebration has begun with the team. Such a close, close finish. Eric Almarola's last win came at Milwaukee. Back in 2007. And that win was credited to Denny Hamlin. Here's another look from the front. <laughs> that is so close. From this perspective, once again, you can't get the depth perception. NASCAR had numerous cameras that they were looking at. Almarola is going to celebrate. He was told that he is the race winner. Such a close call, such a difficult situation. Yeah, baby. Alex is going to go to victory lane tonight. That is a close call. Another look. By that view, I think it's pretty clear the 98 is in front. I mean, that's a much better view. So, yeah, when the yellow came out, actually it moved a couple of frames, and then I think the seven was just starting to make a move to yes. get in front. But when that yellow came out, the 98 was in front of the seven. That's what NASCAR saw. And Eric Almarola has begun the celebration. And, and the green goes out, and it stops for just a second. Then the yellow comes up. Right. So. First Xfinity Series win for Eric Almarola at Daytona in his eighth race. And you see right there that the yellow has illuminated once. I think the 98 is clearly just as it plays four. You see the seven had the momentum of the run. But it's as soon as the yellow lights come on. And we're going to hear from the drivers when we come back. Just moments ago, Eric Almarola with the checkered flag. 
running through the infield and the painted Daytona. The grass in the infield. He knows what it's like to win at Daytona. Won in the Cup Series and now has won in the Xfinity Series. We want to take a look at the wreck that happened behind them. David Reagan hard into the wall. And quite a few cars caught up after the fact. Well, oh, that's a big impact. Now I understand why NASCAR wanted to roll safety personnel. That's a big impact. Car essentially went underneath another car, another impact from behind. So, you know, again, listen, I know race fans want these things to end under green, but you can't fault NASCAR in this situation. No. That's heavy impact with two cars right there, and it only gets worse as this wreck continues. Blake Cook and the 11 involved. David Reagan bouncing around like a pinball. Six of Darrell Wallace Jr. shooting across the track through the infield. Joey Gase in the 52. This impact right here with the 11. The outside wall. And then another impact right there. Yeah, I just, I just, I just, again, we want it to end at the start finish line, no doubt. But you are going. They wanted to roll safety personnel. There are a lot of hard impacts on the back straightaway. They tried to give it a shot. They tried to go green, get it to the line. They just felt like they had to roll safety personnel. There's nothing wrong with that. No. You cannot fault NASCAR. We've seen drivers injured before. They need to get safety personnel to them quickly. Got no problem with that call whatsoever. And it was a matter of fraction of a second that determined between Eric Almarola being in front or Justin Allgaier being in front. Let's go to Mike Massaro. And Eric Almarola just about to get out of the race car right now. Celebration is on. A home state victory. This has been a magical place for him over the course of his career. Remember back to 2014 when he scored a Sprint Cup Series victory here. That is perhaps the biggest win of his career, but this one is right up there for sure. A photo finish victory for Eric Almirola in your home state of Florida. Did you even know that you won the race? No, I was. Uh, I knew it was close. I knew it was really close. I had a, a good push from the 18, and uh, I tried to side draft the seven the best I could to try and stay in front of them. I knew they wrecked behind us. I was like, when are they going to throw the caution? I knew I was in front of them. Uh, man, that was crazy. This is so cool. What a season we've had. We've had just a horrible season over on the Cup side, and uh, things just haven't gone our way. And God, I'm so glad to be back in victory lane here at Daytona. This is such a special place for me. I uh, won my first cup race here two years ago, and for me, this is my first Xfinity win. I know I have a win, but there's always been that asterisk next to it. And uh, I've been dying to get back in victory lane in an Xfinity car, so that way I can have said that I've won in all three series uh, without that asterisk next to my name. So uh, I just want to thank the good Lord. And uh, I told my son, Alex, uh, in the motorhome, he was pouting because he didn't want to come inside from playing on the playground. There's Alex down here right now. Yes. We won. Yeah. Yes. I told him he was pouting because we came inside from playing on the playground. And I told him that if he came in and ate his dinner. Abby Lynn over here, too. Abby's with us, too. I told him if he if he came in and ate his dinner, the daddy was going to go race an Xfinity race, and we were going to get a trophy tonight. And we got a trophy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, he deserves a lot of the credit. I want to just clear up for the audience who don't really remember the asterisk. It goes back to 2007, Milwaukee, a race where you started, Denny Hamlin finished. You were credited with the win, didn't get it. This is actually your first Xfinity Series win. In, in regards to that, put it into perspective what this really means. Uh, it's huge. Uh, I hated the fact that I got credit for that. I, I did not like that. I didn't take the trophy when, when they called me the winner. Uh, I didn't take any of the credit all along. I, I always told everybody at the shop and Dave Rogers that day. Uh, Dave Rogers actually got the trophy. They tried to give me the trophy. I didn't want it. Uh, I didn't feel like I, I deserved to win that race because I wasn't in the car when the, when the race was over. Uh, but tonight I was. And uh, tonight we went to victory lane and, and I'm here and I was in the car. So uh, this is my first Xfinity win. No question about it. Congratulations. Before we go. Uh, Fresh and Florida, they're a great sponsor of ours, Smithfield Foods. Um, the, the Florida farmers do so much to provide such quality agriculture and uh, produce for us. And uh, this is really cool. They support us. They support me because I'm from Florida. And uh, just, just a really, really uh, cool night. I know it's the Subway Fresh uh, 250, so hopefully Subway sells a lot of uh, Smithfield bacon and Smithfield ham sandwiches tomorrow.
I'm sure they're proud to be part of a winning team here tonight. Eric Almarola in victory lane in Daytona. Dave? Justin Allgaier missed that chase-making win by a fraction. Did you think it was yours? I guess it just depends on which replay you look at. We definitely had the momentum down the back there. And kind of stalled out in the middle of three and four and then felt like we had it coming back again towards the start finish line but when you lose them by that little bit it, it definitely is frustrating when you can be disappointed with second though it's it's still a good day um, can't think the guys back in the shop enough prepared an awesome car obviously uh, Elliot getting the win here in, in the spring and then Elliot winning at Talladega and we finished second there too so seconds are definitely close but the Hendrick Energy Department uh, Chevrolet everybody that's involved in making these cars go on a racetrack all of our partners um, I mean, I told the guys before the race, this was the best trademark nitrogen Chevy that I've ever had at a restrictor plate, and, and it showed tonight. We got some damage early and was able to battle back, but it is uh, 4th of July weekend, Independence Day. Can't say thank you enough to Xfinity Comcast for allowing us to have the front windshield, uh, to, to have a squadron, uh, Air Force squadron on there, uh, and all the cars that have something on it. It's really the, the true meaning of our sport and supporting the men and women that, that go out there and allow us to come out here and do what we love to do. So thanks to the fans that were here tonight. It was a, a hot one tonight, but it's, uh, man, when you're that close, it's really, really tough. So thanks to all the partners at Junior Motorsports and the guys back at the shop. And we'll keep digging. At some point, we gotta we got to maybe pull one of these off. Justin Allgaier, gracious in defeat, and Junior Motorsports still showing strong in this Xfinity Championship. Let's go to Marty. Well, David Reagan's thinking what could have been this evening here at Daytona, and I, I, it's still the right move, David, to go up and block that outside line? Yeah, you got to. I mean, Tony Hirschman did a great job, and I was kind of a sitting duck. I uh, felt like my teammate Eric Jones did a great job on that white flag lap, and we just got separated. And I didn't really know that third lane was coming as fast as they were, and, you know, I saw that, that the 98 and the 7 had a decent run, but I thought I could block the very top, and, uh, you know, you just – only have so much room and uh, that's just the product of speedway racing uh, i really enjoyed the the ride tonight uh for from joe gibbs racing and, and toyota the camry was fast and you know we made the right moves we were patient when we had to a little aggressive when we had to and sometimes the, the leaders are sitting duck i didn't really want to see that caution come out because i felt like i was in control enough i can make the right decisions but on a green white checkered you have so many guys getting good runs and um we needed to be two and three wide up front i, I didn't need to be by myself so gotta say hello to matt back home uh, thanks to uh, to surface uh, sunscreen and all the partners here let's um, do it again one day you had mentioned the right moves all night long did you feel like before the overtime you had played the race perfectly and it was going to be yours yeah I made one mistake about 30 to go or so I, I was a little lazy and stayed on the bottom I didn't feel like the outside lane had enough good cars to move and I stayed on the bottom and man that outside lane surged and I kind of I got a little mad at myself for not, not being more aggressive. And so the next opportunity that I saw where I could jump up on the outside, uh, I did, and, and it kind of paid off. We were able to find our way up front. But, you know, sometimes you're, you're the fly, sometimes you're the windshield. And, well, we were close. I uh, had a lot of fun. And, uh, like I said, thanks to all Joe Gibbs guys and uh, Toyota TRD. Uh, we had fun. We almost got one but came up a little short. From a potential win to a wrecked race car for David Reagan. Thanks, Marty. Let's take another look at the finish. And when I say the finish, when the caution light comes on, where the 98 and the 7 are in relation to each other. Green light goes out, caution light right there. Guys? <laughs> hey, listen. It's, you want to make a call? Well, listen, it's, it's tough. very tough. You know, it's why we all want the race to end of the line. We all want to be able to see a line 100% right. compare it. It's why every opportunity we get, that's what we want. It's why the fans don't like ending races, not at the start finish line. We don't like it. The drivers don't like it. You want to see a definitive line. I think they got the call right. I mean, I think they, they picked the right winner for sure. But we all wanted to see it at the end of the line. I agree. I think the most important thing is getting the call right, however long that takes. NASCAR took a few minutes to review a lot of angles. They came up with a 90 years the winner. I agree with NASCAR. But you saw it in Justin Allgaier's face in his interview, the disappointment so close and, and we grow up racing to, to a definitive start finish line and all these things but in, in the world of nascar 200 miles an hour with cars crashing you have to have these rules nascar's tried to create rules to make it fair for the competitors i think it's black and white sometimes hard to see but the rules black and white and i think today the rule benefited eric amarola so nascar will look at video They'll look at the scoring loops. They'll use every means necessary to determine what the finishing order will be. Right now, we only know the top six because that's what they have as far as video. Eric Almarola just edging out Justin Allgaier. Ryan Seeg, an incredible performance by Seeg. 
today finishing third. Joey Logano, Brendan Gaughan, and Ryan Reed. Those are the top six. To sort it all out, we have continued coverage from right here at Daytona International Speedway. We go to Krista, Kyle, and DJ. This copyrighted telecast may not be reproduced, retransmitted, or used in any form without the authorized written consent of NASCAR Broadcasting. NASCAR would like to thank all of our loyal fans for your continued support, and we hope you enjoy today's broadcast. It's just that at that moment they throw the, the caution and, and it's unfortunate as Jeff and, and Steve and Rick were all saying, you know, th there's not a good solution to this. Uh, you just have to trust that NASCAR is making every effort to let them race there. But gosh, don't let that take away from some great yeah. racing. That